um, I don't know, this over-reliance on transits has been, has kind of confused people a little bit. Hmm. Um, because there's no filter. It's just like, because everything right. is transiting all the time. <laughs> it's yeah, it's like, it's like every planet is in, is, is under some aspect of it. Well, like, there's a huge obsession with like Mercury retrogrades or whatever it is and like pop astrology. Right. You know, but it's like, there, there are so, like every planet in some capacity is under something going on and there's like, transits everywhere. <laughs> you know, it's just like, which it's just impossible equal, to keep track of. Which won't even, which won't necessarily, won't necessarily like trigger an event. Like the medieval styles that you, you don't, you don't use one thing. Right. Um, and transits are considered the, were considered the weakest because there's no like rootedness to it. Mm. And, um, so it's just kind of like, it's just there. And it's kind of basically, I, I just call it weather. It's weather. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. the weather will affect you. Um, which is why it looks impressive mm. because sometimes, sometimes it's totally a hurricane, <laughs> yeah. but, um, but most of the time it's nothing. And, and Zoller believed that it was, it would affect your mood more. Mm. Um, but, but, but events are going to be uh, by triangulating, you know, several uh, predictive methods at once. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Into the Cauldron. I'm Chris, uh, and I'm joined today by a really awesome guest, uh, Eric Perdue, the guy who translated uh, the newest edition of uh, Agrippa's Three Books of Cult Philosophy. I know this has been requested by a lot of you uh, quite a bit, actually, believe it or not, Eric. You are one of my most requested guests, believe it or not. Um, oh, I had no really idea. Funny. So this is going to be a great <laughs> episode, I'm very sure. <laughs> so how are you doing? Uh, no pressure. I'm great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no pressure. But yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be good. Um, yeah. So I mean, we we were just we were just talking a little bit uh, before we jumped on uh, before we jumped on here um, about just differences between traditional astrology uh, and modern astrology or Renaissance astrology and modern, uh, modern astrology. Um, but let's let's pick it back up. So for like, obviously we're going to talk a lot about some different things mainly some agrippa mm -hmm. probably some traditional astrology some transits in general um and, and other things but how do, like where where do you sort of stand now would you stand more on sort of the, the traditional renaissance astrology side or do you do sort of any do you do any little modern pop astrology at the moment i don't do any modern uh astrology but uh i i, I don't even use my, the outer planets right now so actually i never yeah. have Mm. um yeah i don't that they, they just they look like like they either don't exist in my in my system or i just treat them like as similar to the fixed stars essentially like they they behave i don't even there, there's the, I haven't, i've had them turned up on my software since around 2006 <laughs> yeah so I, I have no idea where they are in my chart anymore it's, i just yeah that. you don't i don't even look <laughs> I, 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 I only like vaguely have them like I, I don't i don't pay attention to any of the, any of the transits with them like i have them like just vaguely shown on my chart but i, I don't pay any attention to them they're they're, uh, they're like they're like light gray yeah they're, they're, they're like faded out like, like in the background <laughs> that i don't care about <laughs> it's like like some like I, every time i talk to my modern astrologer friends they're like oh my god you're going through a pluto transit it's so good i'm like am i like when how <laughs> like what sure sure <laughs> great um well, I mean, where I stand, I, I, I've actually, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm starting to not like the labels of um, Hellenistic, medieval, and Renaissance astrology because, I mean, except except as convenient historical time frames, like I guess. Yeah, because I because the the more I don't know, the more I've been studying it, the more I'm starting to realize that um, everybody was trying to be was trying to be Greek. Mm. And they weren't always really doing that. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, the, all, all the astrologers throughout history are doing what we're doing now. And they're just reading a bunch of old books and trying to make sense of it. Yeah. And so these camps, I think, are becoming, I don't know, I, I think some, some days we get too carried away. And um, um, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in uh, a lot of the Arabic material uh, hmm. because I think that they've, I don't know they've taken a lot of the Hellenistic material and worked with it quite a bit. And they, you know, they made their own tweaks and they made their own additions and things like that. Um, but one of the advantages is that we have 
astrologers like Abu Mashar, who just wrote right. and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And, um, you know, um, so I, I think that, I think even if you're, if, even if you're a hardcore, like Hellenistic astrologer, uh, I think that you're missing a lot by not studying some of the Arabic material, because there's just so yeah. much that, you know, that, that people just simply didn't write about. Um, yeah. But anyway, I guess, I guess my point is like, I, I'm, I just say traditional astrologer and I'm actually starting to hate the word traditional because it's getting co-opted by um, white nationalists and people like that. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's one of those really interesting things, isn't it? Cause I, I think, I, I I had um Dr. Just, uh, Dr. Justin Sledge on, on, on one of these podcasts a while ago, and um, we were talking about the same thing. But your tradition is a very kind of living thing. You know, you're always kind of reinventing tradition. Like nobody mm-hmm. who who we consider as living a traditional life ever thought of themselves as doing so. You know, it's like Agrippa, uh, for example, never really considered himself to be doing traditional astrology in, in comparison to whatever else. They were just doing all the all the shit that there was there was in. He was doing the truth yeah. as he knew it. Yeah, Basically. that's it, right? And it's like, right. like the yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, the this this movement of traditionalism has kind of like I feel like it's it's come out because you're you're seeing it like across the board in occultism. You know, like whether it's whether it's traditional Goetia or it's traditional witchcraft and whatever it is, and it almost always comes out as a reaction to whatever the modernist modernism. Do, you know? it, it isn't. It isn't even just modern practices. It, it, it's like some people are taking it to an extreme where it's a reaction against modernism as a whole. Yeah. Um. I, you know, I've, I've heard of a couple of people who are extreme enough that they refuse to use computers. Um, yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's astrology like, and things like that. I mean, I'm yeah, like, I sure. I just, it's so much, it's so much, like, just use like solar fire, dude. <laughs> it's so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. You don't gain anything necessarily by doing, you know, from doing it by hand, except maybe, maybe it feels more intimate, hmm. but you don't get a different result. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's the thing. But anyway, I know, you know, I guess it's the difference between like traditional and trad, but yeah, um, I, I've been, yeah. I've just been saying like, pre-modern because i mean because the thing is is i think that um i don't know with, with with these categories that people put themselves into um like when all of these um you know especially like when project hindsight start hindsight started are you familiar with them uh, vaguely i've heard i've heard the name yeah. vaguely uh they were probably the first major push to translate um a lot of greek hellenistic material yeah. and um most of it was greek but not all of it and um and they were, they were trying to they were trying to go through they they did some um medieval material as well so it wasn't all hellenistic really hmm. but anyway it's not important <laughs> but when that started um people started there was this kind of like reaction against william lilly for instance mm, i love him and I love <laughs> yeah i mean lilly's great and and you know because lilly wasn't i mean he was clearly doing a i don't know a, a, a different form than what you read about um in videos of balance for instance or something like that yeah. um and, and it's sort of continued i think now that more arabic material is coming out people kind of disregard the later traditional material like lily because yeah. it, because it just because it seems corrupted i think to people but then then you actually read lily and you're like well actually the guy's great i mean he, do, he has a lot of great material in there and mm-hmm. i don't i don't agree with all of it um i think that there are certain things that he just couldn't know because the books weren't available to him, yeah. but he was clearly not a slouch either. And he knew what he was doing and he was doing a lot of great work and he has a lot of examples. So it's like, don't, I don't know. I, I, I still, I still go back to Lily, even though I have like all these books. Mm. Um, it, it's, 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 I don't know, it's, it's worth it. I think just to not worry about it. I think the younger people, I, I think are kind of there. Um, you know, when I, when I started, there was, there was the, 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 there's a lot of tension between the psychological astrologers and the, and the traditional and, yeah. um, and sorry, boomers, it was mostly boomers, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but now, but now like that a couple of decades have passed. Um, and now we have, um, millennials and Gen Z, uh, getting into astrology. They just don't care about those divisions, those conflicts really. Yeah. Um, so there, I, I see a lot more kind of melding, uh, a lot of pre-modern and also modern material. And I don't, I don't love all of it personally, but I think, I, but I think it's great that, that it's not an issue. And so people are just kind of like, when I say I don't love all of it, it's not really, I don't mean that I think it's bad. I just, what I mean is that I don't necessarily practice that way. 
Yeah. It's just not but, your thing. But it's just not my thing. But it's it's I think great that people aren't really worried about it and people are just trying to get the astrology to work. Yeah. Um, and I also have noticed that there's less of an issue doing predictions than there used to be. Because used to, if you said you're doing predictions, um, you know, they would they basically said you're from the Stone Age. Yeah, like I, I've um, noticed that it. it's like a weird, like there, there, like especially early on, like you know, ten years ago, whatever it was, it was like there was like a like when yeah, whenever you said that you were doing traditional astrology or doing predictive astrology, it was always kind of like weirdly frowned upon or fringe because like either it was like deemed, I don't know, like weirdly like unnatural or like the, the, there was this like overarching belief that like the knowledge had been lost, so it was either unethical or like like the people just didn't know how to do it properly, so people kind of like put it on the fringe, and now it's kind of changing a little. It, it has changed because originally, I mean, I, the, both sides were kind of guilty, I think, of digging their heels in too much because I saw a lot of, so there are a lot of modern astrologers basically c- criticizing the traditional astrologers because they were um, going backwards. You know, they were, um, you know, it was like, you know, they, they, we, they, they, were tre- they were treated as if they were like refusing to use a, a lighter and only would, you know, light a fire with flint or something. Mm. But um, but on the other hand, a lot of traditional astrologers were critic were were incorrectly, I think, being too critical against the psychological astrologers because they were also, you know, saying, well, you know, you're you're not doing anything, you're just making a bunch of psychological mumbo jumbo, and yeah. you're you're working a tradition that um has 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 rejected all of its roots and all this kind of stuff. I, I saw a lot of that going back and forth. And um I just haven't seen that too much now. The worst I've seen lately are, are some um, psychological astrologers think that um, if you do traditional astrology, that's fine, but you should take a course in psychology or, ther- or, or therapy uh, in order in order to really work with clients. I'm thinking, no, you just you just don't be a jerk to people, yeah, and you get you let people. Uh, well, like as Lily said, you know, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. He didn't actually literally say this, but he basically is saying, don't beat the client over the head with their chart. I think he said, don't oppress them or something like that. Yeah. Um, that's a more polite way of saying it. <laughs> that's a more polite way, but um, you, you don't do that. And I've, I've been trained through my Afro Cuban uh, practice. Um, they, they have divination systems that will tell you uh, much more direct and harsh things that any astrologer is going to tell you today. Um, they have no problem saying that death is on the horizon and that you're that warning you about illness and that kind of a thing. Um except they tell you what to do about it. I mean, that, that that's right. the thing is they're not going to say you're going to die. Sorry, make your arrangements. Um, they're going to say death is on the horizon. Here's what we're going to do to stop it. Right. Yeah. And, so, um, and what's that? No, I'm sorry. I'll keep going. I, I, I'm thinking. Oh, no. about that. <laughs> <laughs> you're thinking. Um, but I, th- I think a lot of some of the more psychological astrologers think that that's what traditional astrologers is doing. I think some do. Um, I think some are not very delicate, <laughs> Yeah. Um, sure. but, uh, and the, 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 the texts look very indelicate as well, but the thing is missing in a lot of those texts is we don't know how people spoke to their clients. Mm. Um, you know, we don't really have very, very many examples of that. So um, that delicacy intact was probably present then or else they would have no clients. I mean, the, no one's, I, I don't think there's ever a time in history where someone said, um, I want to go to that one astrologer who just abuses me. <laughs> Unless they have like some weird like domination fetish or something where they just like being whacked over their head with their name. You know what? And, and more power to you. I don't, I don't shame. <laughs> so. Yeah, we don't shame here. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, but it, it is something I've noticed, but like even like, like, like even just in, 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 you know, the types of astrology, and it's something that I see quite a lot in, in sort of just, just the general kind of pop pop understanding of astrology. It's like a lot of modern astrologers focus entirely on natal astrology, where it's like, oh, they they look at your natal chart, and that, that that's mm-hmm. kind of it. You know, like a, a, almost a, a large amount of the psychological astrology is all natal astrology. Um, and like I think that's probably where that idea is coming from, where people are like, oh, well, traditional astrologers, you know, you can't really take clients unless you go to get a degree in psychology or go to therapy classes or whatever it is, where it's like, right they're basing it off of the fact of they're using natal astrology. It's like, you don't just go to like, there are tons of different types of astrology. You can do orary astrology, you can do katarkic and electional astrology, whatever it is. And and all of that is, is arguably has a much greater precedent in traditional astrology than it does in, in modern astrology, you know? Yeah. And I think, but 
again, what I think was missing is that if you look at the text by themselves, it's sort of like reading the the the, the comparison I made a while back was if you look at even modern medical um, literature, the, it's it's very cold. You know, it's very clinical, and so yeah. they may. I'm, I'm just making this up, but they'll say something like, you know, if you have this condition, um, it results in death sixty percent of the time. Mm. Um, but then you go actually see the doctor and you have this condition. The doctor is just like, okay, here's some treatments we're going to do. Um, it is a very serious illness, but we'll, but we're going to, blah, 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 blah. They have like their bedside manner. There's action plans and stuff in place. Yeah. Yeah. You don't go to the doctor and they're going to be like, well, you know, 60% of the time you're just going to die and you're, and that's it. You're, you're done. Um, and in some of the astrological literature, they may say, okay, well, if you have, you know, Mars in this place, that it means that you're going to be attacked by wild animals. Um, I, I don't, you know, I, 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 again, we don't know what Abu Mashar told people, but um, I, I don't think he just jumped to that. Yeah. When he, when he, I mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, the truth is people could be attacked by wild animals in any, you know, yeah, like, like, like outside, my, <laughs> but, there, are, there are tons of like foxes outside my house. Like, if I go and like try and take the trash out, I can get like mauled by foxes, and there's just like nothing logical about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, nothing, they nothing be, ancient like, about that, you know. <laughs> yeah um, um so anyway yeah but yeah but, so, but on that note then i guess this, this kind of like segues a little bit into into agrippa and stuff like that as well and and, and looking into speaking sort of wild animals yeah sure um i was i was thinking more on the lines of the curative stuff and, and the, the action plans but wild animals can too i mean agrippa has some interesting uh attributions for animals and things as well which we can uh, look at but um <laughs> so when we're when we're looking into a thing like traditional astrology and and say a planet is afflicted or, or you know there is it says something's going to happen and we're saying and, and you go to an astrologer and they say okay well you can do this this and this to to avert it or make it easier what are some of those properties are we, are we talking about sort of planetary magic here and astrological magic that is is sort of the way in which you can kind of avert things or, or what I'm experimenting with that um, because I, I know abstractly that. At least in the Arabic period, there was a there was a portion of um, the solar the when you did a solar return mm -hmm. that you would come up with prescriptions. Uh, and re a prescription could be anything, but I, I, at least in my assumption, mm -hmm. uh, could be could range between lifestyle to magical. Mm -hmm. And what I've been doing for a little while when I do. Um, a yearly reading i if i see something that's afflicted um you know you, you do try you do look for the the alternatives yeah um i mean I, you know as i don't think i need to i don't think it's a terribly controversial to say that i've been seeing a lot of charts that deal with uh a lot of mental health and um anxiety and things like that yeah. And so you look, you look in the chart for the things that will help the person. And I, you have to kind of gauge the client because some clients aren't going to do astrological magic. Right. And I, I don't like, I have, I have an issue with this sort of like, I don't know. Uh, one of the things that's popular today is re remediation. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it's difficult. I, I think a lot of times people are doing remediation on just a natal chart by yeah. itself. And so problem A that I have with it is that it's that the needle chart isn't always acting the same way throughout your life um, because planets, uh, planets ebb and flow in their influence. Mm. So even afflicted planets in your, in your needle chart can be less problematic in certain periods of your life. Mm. And um, that's kind of the point of doing these ongoing. What's that? I guess like, just, just like when you're going through like analyzer or cool releases or whatever, or different periods to things like that, right? Yeah, that's what it was. That's what any ongoing, um, what's the word I want to use? Prediction, condition, whatever technique uh, is about is to is to find out where the problems are and where the benefits are. So you you can have a planet. You know, I'm, let's just make up an example. Let's just say you have a malefic like Saturn that's uh, in fall. In, in the seventh house and you could say, well, you know, problems with relationships, blah, blah, blah. That, and that's, that's, but that's like, we all know that's not true every day of your life. Mm. 
um, in anybody's life, hopefully. Yeah. Uh, but but if you but then you look at a, at a solar at a solar return, let's just say you have, I don't know, you have Jupiter exalted in the seventh house. You know, maybe relationships aren't so much of a problem that year. You know, maybe maybe it's pretty good, and Saturn's all tucked away somewhere else where it's not harming anybody. Mm. Um, it, there, there's just like there's a lot of different ways to to sort of move this around, and also the other issue I have with with remediation is that I feel like that it's a, like an out of context Vedic technique, and mm. because the the Hindu astrology has or Hindu the the culture as a whole has this entire infrastructure. I guess a cultural infrastructure to 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 deal with things like this, and I also see that in in you know my Afro Cuban practice, we have a whole infrastructure to deal with issues when they arise. Um, so again, you know, if you're told something harsh in a re- in one of the Afro Cuban readings, you're told what to do to fix it, and it could be anywhere from like don't eat so much fat to doing something magical. Mm. Um, it could be all these things or both. And with the, but with Western astrology, we've kind of lost that connection. And so now we're kind of like, okay, well, if you have Saturn afflicted, then, you know, then give to the homeless people. Well, sure. That's great. I mean, we should help the homeless people regardless, whether cool, regardless yeah. of what your Saturn's doing. Um, But, you know, there is an argument that it does help because you're, I guess, working with the diamond of the planet. Yeah. And so the diamond is being appeased, but then. But then, you th- then I think about those ongoing predictive techniques. So what about those times when, when I don't know, Saturn's great and you just stop giving to the homeless? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, like, I, mean, like I, I would wonder if like, you know, it would, it would like your, your improvement would be better if you gave it during a time when it was exalted or worse if you give it, you know, when it's, when it's in fall or detriment or whatever it is, you know, like, I, like there are so many other variables that it's like, you just you can't plan for it you know and unless you're, again unless you're like looking at a natal chart or looking at a looking at a chart every time you leave the house or do something you know you can't plan for that kind of thing right and i think the bottom line is um if you know, if we if we live our lives being decent people mm. um then the rest of it is just kind of like i mean I, I i don't need i should not need astrology to tell me to help out homeless people right yeah um I would hope that we do that regardless. And um, the rest of the astrology should just be like, you know, navigating the, you know, the, the sunny days and the cloudy days of our lives. You know? <laughs> and um, and some, sometimes they're going to be really great. And sometimes they're not going to be great. And um, you can't really stop all of that hmm. you know, regardless of what remediation is. Um, so I, I, so I think that like, if you have, if this year you have really bad anxiety, then do something about it. Go to you know have therapy, um, go out and have fun. Go to a few parties. You know, hang out at the coffee shop and meet people. I don't know, um, but you have to break it, break the cycle somehow. If if you have problems with your marriage this year, then you know work on that or whatever whatever it is. Um, right. I, I think just simply, um, just doing a, a planetary rem- remediation is also kind of while it's not going to hurt, is not addressing the problem right you, not, of, I mean, you, you don't have a, a bad thing almost yeah yeah i mean you're you're not you don't have a bad marriage because the ruler of your seventh house is afflicted you have a bad marriage because there's interpersonal problems right. and, and maybe maybe the, and this i guess this is our planet's causes or indicators but um but you can't live your life um you know just you know in servitude to the condition of the planets either, mm. you know, you, ha- you have to live your life and the astrology is, is an aid, you know, to right. exp- it, it, it's, it's not necessarily fatalistic or anything. Like that. I, I think it's, um, Oh, it's not Lily. Who's, who's it is fatalistic. Other? I think it is fatalistic. Okay, um, it is. Yeah. It's, it's divination, but right. it also doesn't mean that the fix for bad times is to bribe a, a, a spirit. Right. Yeah. Um, it can be, it can help. Uh, I mean, I, I do plenty of works with spirits, but, um, but I, I just, I just, I feel like that we're kind of missing, I don't know. We're kind of missing something in the, there, there's, yeah, there's, feels, there's, some, there's something off. that's been lost in the Western astrology. That's kind of as, yeah. as, as it's come through through the sources and things like that. Um, cause I mean, I, I mean, we, we, we touched on it a little bit here, but I guess the, the, the primary source for most Western astrology is going to be the, the Islamic 
astrology or the Arabic astrology, right? That's mm -hmm. mainly by a sort of picatrix and and other stuff Talking about like ma that. magic, right? Magic, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, magic. I, I I guess everything, but uh, magic absolutely. But I guess like in general, I guess just, uh, just astrological philosophy is, is indebted quite a bit to the Arabic uh, traditions. It, you know, it, uh, if it wasn't, uh, yeah, because we don't we don't have a lot of directly Greek material you know, anymore. Usually, right? A, that's, yeah, comes through that true. filter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think astrological magic is. Um, it isn't just that that's our primary sources. I think that that literally is where a lot of it came from. Is yeah. from that material, you know, because it's. I, I don't think the ancient Greeks did astrological magic. Uh, I'm not going to say they didn't do it, but mm. it didn't wasn't in the form that we're familiar with. Or right. We talk like, about it, it, it would have been. I, I, I assume it would have been more like a collectional or something like that. They might have timed rituals or things with it, but like in terms of like I don't know talismans or whatever. I don't know. PGM has a couple of things that look like astrological ceremonies. Yeah, the, yeah, it's ceremonies. Like describing stones or materials that are now or like the, the the PGM loves to hold the the uh, was it Ursa Major, right? The Bear Astrium, they call it. The Pleiades um, and all that. Yeah. So they it's interesting. They yeah, so they do like the PGM does a lot more kind of fixed star magic than it does uh you know zodiac magic or sort of planetary magic, I guess, which is really interesting. Now I, I haven't thought about that like that. It's really fun. I'm not uh, really sure about the philosophical reason for that, but I, I, I don't think I, I just suspect, I, and I can't, I, none of us know for sure, but oh. I don't, but I don't think that they did these elections like we're accustomed to. I think the, this idea of doing the elections with the ceremonies, um, you know, comes from the, I mean, in my, in my opinion, uh, for what that's worth, um, I think that's more Haranian. Yeah, so it's like the Sabians and, and the Haranian stuff. Yeah. And um, through the accident of history, that that stuck. Yeah, yeah. Because I suppose it's, it's interesting as well. Like, I, 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 like, I, I know, especially in in the the magical tradition, that there is now, a, thankfully, a huge influx of sort of the Islamic sources, and and that's kind of there. We are going through kind of an Islamic renaissance almost when it comes to astrology now. You know, there, there are loads of new sources that are coming in, but it like. I don't know if it, I don't know if it's just me who like I'm not like super like plugged into any like the major astrological currents, but it's like the in terms of like modern occultism and like modern occult practice, there's like there really doesn't seem to be a lot of discussion about the Islamic influence on things. Like like outside of outside of like niche astrological circles, like the impact of the Islamic yeah. stuff just isn't there. Like it's always not talked about as much. It'll it'll happen eventually. The the uh what I've noticed is in all these revivals, the astrological world kind of kicks in first. <laughs> yeah. And then the occult world sort of catches up uh, because a lot of the, the research in early astrology, I guess in an, in an organized way was happening much earlier than it was happening in the occult world. Mm. Um, and now, now both, now both are happening. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think a lot of people intellectually know, that a lot of occult material comes from the Islamic world, um, but we but no one has actually translated it yet, and so right. those people have to show up and start yeah, translating. So it's, like, it's, it's an issue. Yeah, it, it is ultimately an issue of translation, I guess, because like you have like the it's a very niche skill set, I suppose. Like have someone who like knows Western magic enough and also is fluent in Arabic to be able to translate the stuff over, or knows astrology well enough to be able to translate the stuff over. And you know, that's that's a very kind of niche skill set to have, I guess. It, it is. And again, I think there's a little bit of a cultural um, issue here too, because um, yeah, I, I, I spoke, I spoke to a, um, an Arabic magician and, and I've heard this from several people actually, not just him, but he said that, that, you know, in the West we treat um, uh, medieval, like medieval Arabic magic and astrology as these, like, um, I don't know, these sort of distant, um, as something that was practiced in the distant past. Mm. Uh, and then, and now we have to sort of recover what was lost. That's sort of the the tone that we have here in the West. Mm. Uh, but the reality is that it never went away in the Arabic world. Mm. So really, it's just a matter of kind folks cluing us in to what what's actually happening because the the like like talismanic magic never left, and yeah, it's, like it's, it's still being practiced. practiced, and it's still it's especially done through um, um, like like Sufi circles yeah um but he was he was telling me that the thing about and this is uh, i don't know it's in, been in the back of my mind i don't have a lot of um i don't have a huge 
a lot of like a lot of proof here to flesh out what I'm saying. So, but what I what I've been hearing is that Picatrix is literally a drop in the bucket, mm-hmm. and so we're we're relying on this book uh, because it it happened to make it to the West, yeah, and um, it became influential. Um, but it, it but it, in the Arabic world, it's sort of like okay that that was that was the thir- that was the not even thirteenth century. I guess it was earlier. Um, 10th or so yeah, like century. 10th century yeah um but that that was that we have all this other all this other all these other developments i mean they have like albuni who is sort of like the agrippa <laughs> um of the arabic world and even saying that's not fair but yeah <laughs> uh, but anyway like, well, i guess my point is that we're 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 kind of working with this fragment that um and i think that the answer is out there it's just that we don't have we haven't had the people to provide all this i also i know, I know like people like albuni um saw a lot of this magic as you know that you had to be muslim to actually practice it yeah and um that's not mentioned in picatrix but mm-hmm. i don't but there's a lot that's not mentioned in Pic- I, I what scares me about picatrix is what's not mentioned basically mm. right um like there's a section in the on the the the, the famous section on the ceremonies yeah that, you know tell you to have the prayer and the the incense, everything, yeah. and all that one of the and this is one of the things i was talking to this person about is that if you look at it's in the arabic version uh is more explicit that says um that you sacrifice the animal and collect its blood for later use hmm. and uh the, the latin just says collect it um right. so my question is okay what's later use mean yeah so, so he wasn't so, sure. So, so, yeah, it, it almost implies like a second ritual, like other rituals down the line. It just yeah. Like mentioned. Yeah. Or or you're just making something else out of it. Um, I mean, I'm I'm thinking in ink, maybe. Yeah. Um, and also it isn't explicit in those in that section that talismans are even employed. Mm. Um, they it could be implied, but it is it doesn't say it. Yeah. Um, so I don't, so I, my question, I was like, okay, well, is this really a, just like a, uh, devotional pra- thing, uh, act that you're just, you're just doing this, you're basically uh, having a communion with the planet. Right. Um, or are you consecrating a talisman or is it both? Hmm. And, um, we don't have an answer. Right. So I suppose this is like, it, it raises the challenge or the issue that is, is present in basically any kind of magical practice. And like, is this religion or is it magic? You know, because like, like the Hari- the Harians and the Serbians, yeah, that's... Have, like, it, it was inherently like a, a, a it was an astral religion, right? Right. So it's like, are we are we doing are we talking about religious practice and devotional work here, or is it a magical practice? And how do we define the two? Or is there even a but difference? That, that's a, that's a modern problem, right? Sure. I mean, like, it, they, it really, they it really doesn't. Matter. Right. They they didn't see a distinction. No, and well, it depends on the time period. In in, in the mm. um, you know, the, in the at the classical period, magic was explicitly um you know was it was like a uh, it was always something that someone else did like yeah. you were never you never would say to your to your like yourself that i am a magical practitioner yeah um ma- you know you you did religion well, yeah those it, it's did mag- magic. magic is the religion of the other guy yeah yeah right yeah and so it, it became normalized at a certain point which is fine words change yeah. um but this whole argument like spirituality versus religion that that's a yeah. modern problem yeah it's not no point <laughs> like basically the same thing yeah i i get it i understand it because religion has been organized religion has been traumatic for a lot of people and i right. I, I, I think that. this is what it is yeah. you know i, I think it, like people are are so obsessed with trying to put all the labels on it mainly because it's they're coming out of religious trauma right it, it's a reactionary thing yeah basically. yeah and i understand that and i'm not belittling that bel- belittling sure. it i can't say the word right now <laughs> um but Technically, I mean, there's no real difference. I mean, religion is is, you know, a tradition. <laughs> Basically, it's that's right. the, the kind of the root of the meaning of the word. And um, um, so I don't know. I, I don't know if it makes it more real if you're disorganized about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. The well, so yeah. Let, let's let's move into. I, let, let's talk about Agrippa then for a little mm-hmm. bit. Um. I, I suppose it, it's a it's an interesting segue, I guess, because like, again, I guess because I, I, does does Agrippa distinguish between magic and religion? Because like, yeah, he ha- he has his whole yeah 
thing. Yeah. What's his distinction? Well, he it is, a, it is a distinction. He actually has a chapter that has, and uh, gosh, you could put me on the spot. It's the threefold helpers of religion, mm. and superstition is one of them. Right. Um, I can't remember the other two off the top of my head. I have to look it up. Um, but but yeah, it, it's um, he doesn't say spirituality at all. Yeah. Um, so to him, it was pretty much all religion. Mm. And magic was a practice that you used, that you did that required religion. Mm. So it was almost like a magic was, um, I mean, he defines it in the first chapter uh, or second right. chapter. It's, it's the, like, the um, hidden virtue, the highest philosophy of nature, I think he says, right? Yes. And um, and importantly, it requires, um, and I'm paraphrasing, but it basically requires uh, spirit and uh, or requires the three something from the three worlds. So yeah. um, that's the, the natural world, the celestial world, and the celestial world can include uh, more than just planets and stars. It, it, it's it's also employing uh, numbers and uh, mathematics because right to Agrippa numbers were, were constructed through ratios. Yeah, it's very Pythagorean. <laughs> yes, exactly. And um, and then the third is spirit basically um and uh and I've, I've i've in the past i've said that you know just because one of those elements is missing doesn't invalidate something as a practice like mm. for instance if you um if you employed something from the natural world which could be anything really yeah. <laughs> um and you included um i don't know you included something from the, from the celestial world then, but not, but but not included spirit. Then, that could be something like theater. Mm. And so, theater is not invalid, but it's not necessarily magical. But you can do magical theater if you had if you had <laughs> if yeah, you had so spirit yeah, to he, it. Yeah. So it's yeah, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So I guess like yeah. So his his perception of sort of celestial is, is almost like abstract concepts. You know, like the, like the theoretical numbers or, or anything like that as well as well as the planets and the celestial stuff, right? It it does, and and I think it's also a, a something that's important because we t today we tend to think of things like imagination and abstract uh, abstractions as mm -hmm. being just purely a mental process that isn't necessarily like you know real. Yeah. Um. But but to him, or to the ancient world, you know, people uh, as a whole, um, it was all real. Yeah. Um, and and even when you said that, like, you know, Agrippa was saying that when you spoke, um, the words that you said were creating uh, a concrete form, essentially, to a thought. Mm. So, so it begins kind of in the celestial. So a thought, I guess it begins in, in the intellectual world. Then it, sort of, it takes on a kind of a form in the celestial and then it takes on the physical form with your words, I guess. Yes. Yeah. yeah. By, by you actually saying the words, it then becomes physical. Which is very mm. Egyptian. Yeah, I was gonna say. I was gonna say it's very, very Egyptian. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, so, I, mean, I mean, that's. I mean, yeah. So I mean, that's another interesting point. So then, because I mean, we can see clearly there, there is like he's drawing on Picatrix for a lot of the stuff. Um, and I mean, he does attribute some major things to Egyptians and Chaldeans and Arabs and that kind of thing. Um, well, by just by name, but not necessarily reality. Yeah, that's the well, that's, yeah, that's the thing, isn't it? Because he's he, like he's he's sort of, he's very typical of like the other of the kind of Renaissance authors and, like, and that kind of era. It's like every, everything is kind of orientalized and it's like oh, it's all Egyptian, it's all Hebrew, it's all Chaldean. The Chaldeans, yeah, yeah. Um, um, and how, how much it, actually is from that is questionable, right? Oh, no, it's well, it's, it's all questionable, but it's okay. Uh, I yeah. mean, really, it, it, I think people get too hung up on the literalness, literalness. Mm. Um, realness, <laughs> okay, so, yeah, like, like the historicality <laughs> or whatever, yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, I can't remember the name of the fish, but he, he mentions it a couple times. But the fish that if it touches a ship, it will stop the ship in its tracks. <laughs> um, Echinaeus, I think it was, hmm. and um, so people get stuck in this, like, well, this fish is mythical, never existed. Uh, look at that stupid guy, <laughs> but um. But then, but then you know, you look at the context that he's saying it in. He's you know talking about magical contagion, basically. Mm. And um, so, while the fish may not be real by our standards, the you know from a you know if you're doing magic, magical contagion is real. That's just an example of it. Mm. He's he's trying to use a a biological example that today we 
no is not real, but yeah. that's not the point. Mm. I mean, he yeah. does say things, some things I think don't really, I mean, off the cuff, he mentions, you know, to, to cure headaches, a lion will eat the, eat, the, eat, eat an ape. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's really necessarily useful, but yeah um, yeah so like so, uh, uh, it's like some at well, least a lot more like the especially in the first book like some of his like natural cures i i can't remember what it was he mentioned something about snails like if you like eat a snail or something it does something i can't remember what i can't remember what it was um but like yeah like by all standards they're a bit you know some, some of his naturalist cures are a bit weird but they're not necessarily well, that, that's all from plain yeah most of that's plain and yeah. um and we, and that's the thing is like I, I don't even we don't even know if Agrippa did those things, right? Um, or if he's just like parroting it off from like some other source or something. Yeah, they're one of the frustrating things is there's supposed to be an, a a plant that you eat. It's a, yeah, it's a no, it's a stone. It's a stone that you have that's mm. supposed to um, allow you to speak to the gods. Mm. And he has this name, and no one knows what that stone is. Right, and. I've had a couple people ask me, like, well, you know, what did what did Agrippa do? And I'm like, well, he probably just wrote it down. Mm. Yeah, I don't, I don't think Agrippa knew what it was. Uh, you know, the the scholars today don't know what it was. Mm. Um, Pliny probably knew. Yeah, but... <laughs> yeah. So, so, so this, this is like an uh, yeah, this is an interesting sort of segue into, I guess, like textual textual hermeneutics and translations. How do you? Oh, I guess I, I guess for you because you got you've actually you know translated three books. How do you begin to kind of how do you even approach translating something like that? Because it is like a hugely monumental thing, you know, like it, it's a huge Renaissance thing. But like also like the three books aren't his only work. You know, you've got the you know mm -hmm. um, the Encarno de Turine, so the Omnia about uh, the Bounty of the Arts and Sciences. He also right. writes, uh, which I found out about recently, which I think is hilarious. He writes like the whole treatise on like how women are much better than men. On like in like yeah, it's a, it's, everything. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's a proto feminist work. He, yeah, he did that in really honor cool. of his patron, who is um, a queen, and yeah. um, he actually got in trouble for it. Mm. Yeah, that was one of the times he was brought up. Yeah. <laughs> that was um, one of the times he was brought up in the Inquisition. Yeah, because like um, wasn't yeah because weren't the weren't the three books um they were condemned as, as heretical by the Inquisition, weren't they? I can't remember the guy's name. but one of the guys in the Inquisition condemns them as heretical. Uh, I can't think of his name, but nothing happened. Uh, okay. He, he, so. yeah, he was, um, he's brought up on charges, I think uh, about three times mm. and all over things that he wrote. Yeah. Sounds about um, right. And I think three books, I think it's, it was brought up, but nothing happened. And that, I think it's one of the reasons why he had um, not just for Themius, but he also had um, uh, Herman of, I think it was Austria. Um mm as a one of one of his patrons uh, mm -hmm. that's why he had him on there as well and did offer us offer him some protection um the only time he was ever jailed was at the at the end of his life for debts mm. um but never he, he he got in trouble for everything else but you know it was everything yeah because he, he's and, had like quite an exciting life in general i think you know, like like people like yeah. I I think this is it's something that's kind of missed a little bit. Like when you like like when you read about Agrippa in the context of him, you know, and his life story, it's like the guy was like a mercenary in Spain. He was like like an international like almost like a super spy. You know, like I'm, I'm, a spy. I'm surprised like there hasn't been a movie made about him. Like his life is so interesting and insane. Yeah, and 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 I don't think he was. Yeah, he had a uh, he had a, he had a, a really well. They they said. A, a wife that repudiated him. That was a word they used, which I assume meant that she cheated on him. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. But um, other than the, you know, the infamous story about the black dog. Right. So, like I heard, uh, I heard like a random meme going around like Reddit that it was a poodle or something. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know. Like, so, I, I don't know where this idea came from, but I've heard it in a couple of like, the online like of people were going like, yeah, Agrippa <laughs> owned like a demonic poodle. Like, like a poodle, black poodle or something. <laughs> well, they are, like, they are demonic, like, familiar yeah. or whatever it was. <laughs> but poodles can be pretty demonic, though. Um, yeah, his name is Monsieur, like Mr. Okay, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, I, uh, Lynn Thorndike who wrote the history of um experimental science magic and experimental science um said that um that if agrippa had never written three books um that he would have gone down in history as being one of the great 
Renaissance scholars, period. <laughs> yeah. Um, but his, but his reputation just, you know, forever got tied to this occult work. Mm. Um, so it, you know, that, that's one of the things I've, I've kind of, I've ranted about this in the past that, um, that, you know, today we look at the occult as being this, like, as a, as a specific way of practicing magic. Mm. Um, that's, you know, kind of goth and you're dealing with, you know, the demons and all this kind of stuff. And it's all very mysterious and you have to be hush hush about everything, all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, but like in Agrippa's time, um, you know, if you read, I mean, in Agrippa's time, occult, I mean, occult does mean hidden, but I think mm. people forget what, what hidden can mean. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and when you re- when you read three books, you'll you'll see that he basically he does talk about th- keeping things secret, but he also talks about like occult virtues of plants. So what is he what is he talking right. about? He's not talking about demons. He's talking about just things that you can't that we can perceive but not understand. Hmm. Um, and so f- from a grip standpoint, a plant an occult use of a plant could go could be anywhere from what we would call magic today to just a medicinal cure. So the fact that like a willow bark can help cure a headache, we, you know, he would not have known why he just mm. knows that if you take a willow bark, that it cures a headache. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, that's occult, about, cause, right? cause the original Latin, I think uh, like occultus or occultum, they, it literally just means hidden. Right. Yeah. Certain, certain Latin words have, have acquired this sort of like dark, mysterious connotation to them. And occult's one of them. The other one's um, arcane. Mm. Arcan just which just means secret. Mm. Um, you know, in, in English, if you say something is hidden, it doesn't necessarily I mean we hide Christmas presents. Yeah, the, 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 occult, the occult perspective on Christmas presents. <laughs> right. The the yeah. your present has been occulted. Yeah. Um <laughs> well, cause I, cause I think um I, I, yeah, like because I think like ma- ma- magnetism was seen as an occult quality in the Middle Ages. I did, I did a like, meme like, on that. Yeah, yeah. Before, like, before, like, it, like before the Renaissance, before Agrippa, I think, like, because they didn't know how it worked. It was, it was like you know Einstein's spooky action at a distance or whatever for quantum mechanics. Like, and I, like it's one of those weird things. Like, you see all the, like the modern New Agey types like appropriating quantum mechanics, and and it's, it's kind of like you know the whole quantum field or whatever is, is an explanation for it. It's like they're treating. You know, or like the way it's kind of treated, quantum mechanics is treated as, as an occult thing in the same mm-hmm. sense as like magnetism was or psychology was back in like the 1900s. You know, when it, when it, when it, like it's just anything you don't really know how it works, it's hidden. You know? Quantum is, yeah, it's the new buzzword now. Yeah, it's it's the big thing. You know, it's like in the same way, like, like even technically, technically speaking, I guess like something like gravity could even be described as occult because we don't know how it works. You know, there isn't like a, like right. we have like theories and ideas and stuff, but like we don't have a working understanding. So it's a cult. You know, and, and like, uh, yeah, it, the it's acquired bang, this weird know. reputation. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I always joke around that um, uh, Agrippa was was a juggalo, yeah, because mm. magnets and all that. Mm. Yeah, um, but yeah, so like uh, this is, I guess, like how do we sort of loop back loop back around the original question? I guess then, how do you begin to approach translating something like that? You know, because like, there because there are so many different. You know wh- whether it's it's mindsets and and, and ideas, especially again with, with with words and things that we don't know what he meant with certain things. How do you begin sort of you know working with all that kind of work and putting it into a context or anything like that? Um, I li- I literally just started at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, um, it worked backwards. Uh, I di- I don't I don't really skip around. I, I have to do the that's I don't know if that's my part of like an OCD ness of me. I have to start from in order, but um. No, what what I, I think what I had to do was when I started it, I didn't really realize. Um, I, I started. I noticed with the first chapter that Tyson hadn't really used, in many cases, the um, primary sources. Hmm. So even even if you even if if um, Agrippa mentions Plato, hmm. um, and Tyson will correctly identify the reference in Plato. Agrippa was not quoting Plato. Hmm. He was quoting Vicino or somebody else. Right. Um, it's a, like a little Russian nesting doll. Um, but um, so I, I think, I think what the big thing for me was that was going to the original material hmm. and seeing the context that it came from. And, um, 
and in some cases the material was already translated in English and in some cases it wasn't um and the things that were already in English that really cut down my work quite a bit because I could just sit there and read it casually um but it's it's at the, very important for the context because because there's I think I, I think there was kind of a myth with um three books that Agrippa had sort of acquired these forgotten texts hmm. um and and excerpt you know, and you know summarize them or whatever uh but in reality he was using texts that were familiar to any intellectual at the time right um the thing that was unique with agrippa was that he was he was formulating his own argument and that that to me that was a revelation that he was formulating a uh a personal argument based on other people's words hmm. uh, which is a fascinating idea and as much as people like to accuse him of plagiarism i like to see somebody try that um yeah. it's it's uh, i don't know to me to me it's impressive <laughs> to do that um yeah. but yeah for me it was it was just like I, I think it was just noticing that again with the very first chapter that um that i that, that i could not go by what tyson was was writing right um in his sources and um um and it, and it just kind of opened up this whole i don't know whole new world to me um mm. I, I never really read a lot of the Renaissance writers quite as much up to that point. And so I learned to love Ficino quite a bit. Oh yeah. Uh, from, I love, I love Ficino, books, but yeah. yeah. Ficino next to a grip or I would say Ficino is probably my, my, probably my favorite. Like the, the three books of life is basically like an astrological self-help manual for like scholars. Right. Because we're like, right. because we're like so oppressed by like occultists and scholars, because we're so Saturnian, like we're all like depressed, like melancholic all the time. So he writes the three books of life, like as this like, like a cult self-help book. And it's just like, Oh, I love it so much. It's so good. <laughs> then he, his other opus was uh, the platonic theology. Right. And, and it's uh, under the radar of most they, people. They, they, they Christiana as well. Right. So that's on the Christian yeah. theology as well. Yeah. Right. And, um, Platonic theology. I don't know about the Christianity, but it's it's. I, I know Platonic theology was has been translated because I have it. Um, <laughs> it's it's a, a excellent excellent book. But yeah, um, I I didn't I I knew about Ficino from three books, but I didn't know everything else he did. Hmm. And um, I I scanned his Opera Omnia by hand. It yeah. was like these two immense two volumes are like this thick, and they were hmm. you know this huge. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I mean, I just, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, like you know, the, the same way you eat a snake, you start with the head and end with the tail. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that works. Yeah. Cause, I mean, how, because I suppose, because like the, when you're looking at the free books, the other thing that I am, um, I remember when I, when I was doing my sort of back end research into all of them, uh, when I was like putting it all in, in historical context, because like they weren't, like because there are there are two drafts right in in, in like a griffin's a mm -hmm. like original translations like mm -hmm. he starts writing it around i think like 1510 something like that and then 1510 like, yeah yeah and then like but they're not but they actual they're not actually published or printed until like 20 years later like the 1530s isn't it um and right. there's like the second draft or whatever it is that he makes is quite radically different to the early draft that he wrote when in his like sort of like, like 23 or something isn't he when he when he first starts writing it I think, something like that. that yeah yeah um, but they're, they're quite so yeah, different so how do you approach like do we have both of them how do you approach we do the, like the inconsistencies and and, and the, the differences and things like that so first of all first of all i think it's a miracle that we do have both right um and um because the first one was only manuscript i think there were copies that were made uh mm. several copies and I know that just from a from a historical standpoint, um, part of his motive for writing this is not exactly what you ask, but no, it's good. Just back, just some background. Yeah. Um, but but part of his motivation, um, I mean, a few things went into to finishing it. Mm. Um, a he got permission to publish several books. Mm. Um, he had imperial privilege to um to publish so he he ended up like a lot of things he had written before just sort of all started coming out at the same time mm -hmm. and um um but part of his motivation was that when he wrote the first draft he was in his early 20s and copies of that manuscript had leaked out over the years and as he got older just like in, the, any any of us <laughs> mm -hmm. um we look at what we wrote in our 20s and he was yeah. just like oh my gosh you know the that doesn't yeah. like, represent me anymore <laughs> 
So he decided to take control and he revised it and published mm-hmm. it. And um, so the, the differences. Um, so the first draft was smaller, much smaller. And it was um, kind of ordered differently. Um, mm-hmm. Surprisingly, there isn't a lot that was taken out in the final edition. I didn't really see a lot of that. I saw a lot of um, revising in the sense of like expansion mm-hmm. and organization. Um, and it was expanded a lot in the final edition. And one of the, the, the two, two that I think major contributors to this was um, one of his main influences is Johannes Reuchlin. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, the famous German uh, Kabbalist. And when Agrippa had written the first draft, um do i have this backwards uh, okay i think i may have it backwards now that i'm on the spot i <laughs> think that he already had art of kabbalah released i'm pretty sure he did uh yeah. when he did the first draft yeah. um and then when he then throughout the years Reckland came out with another book uh mm-hmm. called uh um verba Modifico, which is on wonderful words and um that 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 also bulked up three books quite a bit. I might have it backwards. I can't remember if which I think Art of Kabbalah came out first, but I might be wrong. Mm. Um, one of those came out first, and the other book that came out was was from um, Francisco uh, Zorzi called Harmonia Mundi on the Harmony of the mm. World. Yeah, and um, that book is physically larger than three books. It's enormous, and. I for a while was tempted to translate it, but I don't think anybody would want to read it. Yeah, um, I, I guess like, outside of like niche occultist circles or like people who have the time and really dedication niche. to, yeah, but like extreme niche because it's there's a lot of um, Renaissance European Kabbalism in it, mm. um, and a lot of trying to reconcile Christianity with with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't think I, a lot, I don't think it's interesting to a lot of people. Agrippa really did take out the best parts from it. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, it, it's it's an interesting book because it was it's called Harmony of the World, and it's it's interesting that it was it was uh, written in uh, um you know, the, in eight books, and the books are called octaves. Okay. So and, uh, yeah. Okay. So because of harmonics, yeah. Okay. Right. And then each octave is divided into. Um, uh, books which of various numbers and then each and then each secondary book is then divided into chapters hmm. and so, so it was like so I th- it was like uh it was octaves tones and i think the chapters were just called chapters <laughs> <laughs> I, he, 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 lo- he lost the narrative at that point yeah um but yeah it was like uh, you know octave one tone two chapter blah hmm. uh but it, it's kind of interesting but it's it's i don't think that like something anybody wants to read it yeah <laughs> maybe but I, I don't know um but that that bulked up three books quite a bit he also included a lot of um just smaller you know works after that mm. picatrix i'm not even sure he had a copy of okay um i i have a suspicion that um when he wrote the first draft he was part of that little occult circle friend mm. group um and i suspect there was a lot of note taking yeah um because the the what's interesting is um when you compare picatrix's material on like the deccans and um the mansions you'll see they're different Mm. and the reason why is because they are and i'm kind of simplifying this a little bit but there are basically combinations of um uh picatrix and ludwig of austria and somebody else um but they're all kind of put together into like new descriptions mm. um a group of it, a group didn't really make up any of it they were just it's like this sort of like a combination of two or three different writers right and um and then like there's this like off this one sentence in picatrix that's out in the middle of nowhere uh where it mentions that you're supposed to measure a corpse three times and that's just in the middle of something and that's all yeah. he has from Picatrix. He has nothing about like incense recipes or yeah. uh, prayers or ceremonies, nothing like that. It's just like the Deccans mansions. And then it's one little weird sentence. Yeah. Well, cause I was going to say, cause uh, the, even the daily incenses, so, so, so the, the plantry incenses differ between Agrippa and Picatrix, don't they? 
I think. Yeah, I don't even know where he got those from. That's that I, was I, always thought, I always thought it was the Hetameron or the Lucidarium or somewhere like that. Like, Maybe. I got that, that's that's like my first that's like my 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 first guess. But like also, um, it's like in the 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 pseudo fourth book of isn't that like half of it basically just the Heptameron? Like somebody just like stitched a Heptameron yeah. into it as well as like day and card to the day or whatever else. Yeah, it's 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 literally like not even attributed to Grippa. <laughs> yeah, so. like, no, I think like no one because like a, a, like hardly anyone thinks it's actually about Grippa. Like, like, is it um, Weyer? So his student like critiques it. I think doesn't he? Like, like it's not by Grippa, and everyone's now kind of more or less on the same page saying it's not by Grippa. It's somebody just like using his name. Well, except for occultists. Occultists want to believe it. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, no, I, I get so many questions about it, and I, I had. God, years ago, I had this one occultist come, you know, like he looks so bothered too. He goes, Is it a real book? I'm like, Yeah, it's a real book. Probably not Agrippa, but you know, it's it's fine. Yeah. You, I mean, it's still useful. Um, yeah, the, the I, I just wrote about, uh, I did a post on this, but um, that if you look at, 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 because, um, so I, I don't entirely know all the decision making into, you know, that went into this, but hmm. uh, Agri- Agrippa's Opera Omnia is in two volumes. And the first yeah. volume is really fat. It's really huge. And the second volume contains uh, three books of occult philosophy. Yeah. And then it contains all this other stuff. And um, the fourth book is really tiny. Mm. And uh, and, it, and it came out much later. It came out, you know, it was the first um, time it appeared was way after Agrippa died. Yeah. And it, it really doesn't, you know, r- d- despite what a student said, um, it doesn't really fit because the three books the reason why there are three books is because there are three parts to well, the world. Yeah. And so it's kind of following that um, schema and, and a gripper really loved these, you know, this kind of like, Oh, there's like, yeah, you, know, you have the three parts of this, the three parts of that, the three parts to the other, to the other thing, the soul, uh, the world, everything. Mm-hmm. And um, so just adding like a fourth part uh, willy nilly just seems kind of odd. Cause you could yeah. easily just put that as part of book three, if you wanted to. Yeah. So, um, it's, it, it's all on ceremonies and stuff anyway you know I, 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 it like, is that book is all ceremonial magic anyway so like it would make sense to just kind of fit it into the third, third book and if he did write it he probably would not have called it a fourth book he probably probably just would have said on ceremonies mm. <laughs> and leave it at that he wouldn't call it the fourth book um the there's a one anonymous geomancy geomancy text um that no one knows who wrote that he may have written, may not have written it. Um, I don't think he wrote the fourth book. The rest of it doesn't even have his name on it. Mm. The rest of the texts. Yeah. And I think on this note as well, doesn't he, isn't, isn't there like a, a debate about, about whether he actually mentions Goetia at all in the three books? I, oh, I he doesn't. He, yeah, he doesn't. I, I, I've heard, I've heard no. this is like a recurring debate where uh, people are like, he follows he or he like people are arguing that he follows Trithemius's condemnation of Goetia or whatever it is, but he doesn't actually mention it in the three books, does he? No, and the reason why people say that though is because in the JF translation, mm. uh, there's there's like a an, like an appendix sort of thing at the end uh, after the end of book three that has these like kind of one page descriptions of different magical um mm. things. <laughs> uh necromancy is one of them. Um and uh, those are all excerpted from uh, on the vanity of the sciences, right? So Goetia, that that section on Goetia is not in three books at all in the original mm. version. I didn't translate it in there as well either on my mm. in my version. And yeah. I just for the just for the hell of it, I recently did a because I'm cool and I have a PDF of my own book. Sure. Um, <laughs> um, I did a search; it's not mentioned at all. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. And I, I would have translated as Goetia if it was in there. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't have like. I wouldn't have been too creative with that. Yeah, well, yeah, cause I suppose because this is the, like this is the other thing that I've I remember reading somewhere in my own research. Uh, when I was I was looking into uh, the Encarta, the Tooth Nays so on the Vanity. Um, you kind of have to read. I like. I don't. We well, don't have to, but if you're approaching it from a practitioner standpoint, you can kind of just look at the correspondences and things that he does. But if you want to understand kind of the scholarship and the background of it, I think you kind of have to read. On the vanity and three books together, almost as like, like as well, not necessarily synonymous, but like read them together to get the context. Because I think, I don't know, it feels almost like he's writing 
three books as like an answer to the skepticism that he proposes in on the vanity because like in on the on the vanity he kind of just critiques all all aristotelian logic basically it's like yeah right. everything is unknowable right. like the only thing that's true is like the word of god or whatever it is right all the nature right. of the universe. um so then he writes like i, I apparently like why i'm well the way I, I kind of see it is that he's writing three books almost as a response to the skepticism that he raises earlier on in on the vanity so it's like, that could have been an like, afterthought, though. Yeah, so that's it, it's because, like it, it's available, but yeah. Well, what do you think? Well, because it? I mean, I, I I think it's it's as a narrative, um, it, it's, it's it could be valid. Um, mm. I think as a hindsight narrative, it could yeah. be. Uh, I don't. I, I mean, I think his motivation was pretty simple, mm. uh, because he did the first book he wrote was three books. Yeah. Um. And the, the 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 narrative of the book itself never really changed. Hmm. So, in a way, on the vanity of the sciences is could be a response <laughs> to three books. Yeah. Um, but I think that considering that he published um, on the vanity of the sciences and then published three books, and he was probably working on them at the same time. Hmm. So could you could say that? in some ways, but I think, uh, so, uh, I mean, this is not a scholarly opinion, but my feeling about the grip as a person is that he was somebody who we all have those friends, by the way, where he, we've had those friends that, um, do that just really piss people off yeah, by saying the wrong thing and not being diplomatic enough, yep. I know, I know but the they're part. actually, yeah. mm -hmm. but they're actually right. Mm. Uh, but but because they don't have the tact or they don't or the or the right timing or the communication is, style just, whatever. yeah the communication style it just it just it just ends up making people angry and they end up getting in trouble even mm. though they're right and I feel like Agrippa was one of those people mm. and um he had a lifelong problem with the authority of the church. Mm. And authority in general. Um, so I think on this on the vanity of the sciences is is a definitely a response to that thinking. Mm. Um, three books is to your argument could be considered part of that same thinking. Mm. Um, except more eloquent. Um, I think I think on I think on the vanity was written as a satire just to poke people mm. yeah. and i think three books was written to actually put forth a statement that he wanted people to hear mm. uh because the you know the the there's two there's two main themes in, th in three books i think that the, one of them is to show that magic is just part of nature yeah it's just part of like you know, it's in the bible it's all these other books that all these all the, the, that the church agrees with magic is in it. Um, and the second is to, is to define what good and bad magic is. Mm. And um, uh, Ficito and Trithemius both had this sort of view that, um, that if you were, that if magic was part of nature, if you're working with nature, then you probably were Okay. Right, so it, it's and the you, natural you magic from debate, I guess, like, or like natural versus right. demonic magic, yeah. And you stay away from the, stay away from the demonic, yeah. And Agrippa's uh, view was that uh, the diamonds are okay, can be okay, not all of them, mm -hmm. um, because diamonds are just part of nature, as well. They're just a part of the order of the universe, and um, so you tap into the ones that are that are beneficial. Um, and you work with nature and all these other things, but you always have to sort of know that the source is God. God is the ultimate authority. Mm. Um, and he, he said several times in the book that if you practice magic, uh, believing that nature is the source and cause of magic, then you'll be led astray. Mm. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and then the other part of magic too, which is implied, well, actually it's stated um, a little bit in the first book um, that the other element of magic is the intellect of the, of the magician. Mm. 
And the, the example I always give people is it's almost like you get a book, you know, I, I like food. And, um, if you, if you get a recipe book, um, you have these instructions on how to make something. And so let's just say you have this really good recipe book, um, that's clearly, clearly written and you have all the ingredients together. Um, if the, if your intellect is not up to the task, you're never going to make that dish. Mm. Yeah, make it well. it's, like, it's like, yeah, but whether you're intuitively combining, you know, uh, materials or ingredients, whatever it is, or like knowing mm-hmm. just intellectually, like how long to boil certain things for or whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, so I think magic is the same way. Um, yeah, you have the the intellect. Basically, the 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 binding <laughs> of all this is is well, actually what he says is the the imaginative spirit hmm. of of the magician. Um, and so, without that, the magic won't happen. Yeah, and I and I kind of look at magic as something that, while it's it's natural and part of the universe, it's almost like um, it's almost like making a dish. It's like you're using things that are just part of nature. But you're ba- you're basically making something that can only happen through manipulation. Hmm. Uh, a little bit of a, a little bit of a you know if the tree falls in the woods with no one to hear it, will it make a sound? Hmm. Um, I guess that's a question: Is magic going to happen if no one's actually you know doing doing the act? Yeah, I I, I remember talking. Uh, I remember yeah, I remember, I remember talking to Warlock about this. Um, when you're like uh, I, I like the, reading for chino is what like made me have this weird like shift in my mindset of like if you like put it into context especially if we if we you know understand astrology is fatalistic like if you're doing like astrological magic for example and you do a ritual for something at a specific time is it actually your intellect and your intention that's driving that or have you been led to do the ritual at that specific time you know it's like as an example like i i remember mm-hmm. this was I talked about this on a podcast like two months ago, three months ago. Um, I was doing a sun talisman, uh, mostly mostly for Gino based, Picatrix based, um, and the pretty much the exact moment when I sort of did did the, the fumigation and uh, decided the off like him everything. Uh, a guy outside my window because like, my ritual room's on the outside of the house. It's like looking down to the street, um, and like pretty much the second I finished the Orphic him and the fumigation, a, like a, a guy just like runs past jogging, like in bright yellow with like the sun like plasters <laughs> on his jacket. You know, it's like and then like at the same time I look at him and then I look up and uh, like across the street there's like a like it's, it's like some random like tree cutting company whatever it was, but it was like it was like they were called Helios. Like Helios Olympic, <laughs> uh, and they were like, coming, and they just like pulled up on the van outside my house. And like, I was, I was like looking at my talisman, like looking at the outside. I was like, huh. <laughs> you know, it's huh. like it's very weird, but like, then, then it like gets you thinking, it's like, okay, did that all happen because I did the ritual, or did I get led to do the ritual at that moment when those things just happened to come by? And they're like, in order to give me an indication that the ritual worked, you know, like who's actually running the show here? Am I doing it? And are they responding to my intellect? Or well, times is, times yeah. have a magical effect, right? And this is this, and yeah. I mean, like, so it gets complicated. So I think, like, okay, so the a guy a guy runs by your window, and you have some a tree company across the street that have like a has a solar name. Mm. Um, I wouldn't think that you or I or anybody else would cause that to happen. Mm. Um, but the time has a very solar character to it. So yeah. I think people get bits can, can get compelled to act at certain times. Um, that is not to say that the tree company is talismanic either. Mm-hmm. So the, the, so the magic part of it was the talisman that you made and the act that you did. Yeah. But the time had a magical, had a particular character to it. As, yeah, because I, you know I, I, mean? I I elected it during a solar hour. Uh, it was it was during Leo and stuff as well. So yeah, it was an hour. It was the solar hour, and the sun was strong as well. You know, so that also factors in. I mean, it's sort of like if you go swimming, hmm. and there's a bunch of people at the pool, um, you didn't you didn't cause those people to come there, right? But the time did. The hmm. time impelled people to want to go swimming at that time, right? Um. 
I mean, I don't know. It's God. It, 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 I mean, the example you get, give, there's like so many different yeah, little tendrils that you can kind of go into because there's so many things you can pull on. And then like, right. I got to the point where I just like, I don't like, it, it's precisely this reason that I've just stopped questioning my results. Like I'll just, I'll just accept the result or whatever I get. It's like, I, I get like, I get like weird ones. Like when I did a, a Mercury talisman, um, we were going, I can't remember what it was. Like we were planning to go on a holiday for like the next month, whatever it is. I did a Mercury Talisman the day before. I went into the travel agents and they had like a new branch of brochures, like talking about like wherever we were going. And they were by a company called Mercury Travel. You know? <laughs> and, like, it's, like, it's like, that's the kind of like things that I usually get in terms of my results. It's like, I just, I stop. I, it's got to the point where that stuff just happens so much after I've done talismans that I kind of just stop thinking about like trying to, like wonder whether I'm the result, I'm the cause, whatever. I'm just like, yeah, okay, I'm taking. I don't, I don't think it. you're the cause, but I do think yeah. that it, it, it's, a, it's you're part of the web. Yeah, I, I mean, to, so to give a non astrological example, um, there's uh, one of the uh, in you know in Santeria, there's an Arisha called uh, uh, Alagua, hmm. and I just remember <laughs> it was the first Alagua I was giving someone, and um, he didn't have a car. I, I had to. I picked him up and he was mm. watching three dogs. Mm. Eligua's number is three. Yeah. So he, I, I went up there, opened up the gate and he goes, Oh, do you want to see the dogs? I'm like, sure. And I just kind of walked into the house and all the dogs ran out and the dogs all ran onto the street. So Eligua's a trickster. So he had, we had to go out and hunt these dogs down and we did. We found them all. So then we got to the car and I had to go get gas. And I went to the gas station and there was, there was a, a, a homeless guy there. And that's kind of an Eligua person. Mm. Um, and he's wearing red, red and black, which is Eligua's color. Yeah. And so to use that example, I don't think I caused that. I may have caused the dogs to get out though because I didn't close the gate. Yeah, yeah, but, right. <laughs> but um um but I, I didn't like cause all those like really all the the those the chain of events to happen and it definitely didn't cause the homeless guy to be there and to, and I didn't right. tell him what clothes to put on. Um and I don't think I don't necessarily think that um me doing the ritual that day caused those to happen. I also don't think necessarily that Eligua was being that directed to causing those things to literally happen. I mm. do think that when you're, when you're in a magical headspace and you're doing magical things, uh, magical correspondences do sort of pop up. Yeah. It's almost like they, they get to your notice more. Mm. Maybe, maybe um, some other random day. I would not have put those things together. Yeah. So you wouldn't notice that. I wouldn't have noticed it. Um, because I don't, I don't, I'm not going to for a minute th say that, like, because I'm so magical that I caught that I, yeah, that you're like I, affecting I, the entire world and moving people right. clothes around. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I told, I told that, that my mad, my magical power made that homeless man several days before I put on those clothing that, that, yeah. that's combination yeah. of clothing. Yeah. And stand in that spot. Mm. Um, I wish I was that powerful, but well, if I yeah. was that powerful, I wouldn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> I have a long list of other things to do before I like dress the homeless. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, no, it's it's an interesting point, you know, because I don't know, like I I feel like this, like we don't have. I mean, well, it's it's part of a wise because, like, one, we don't necessarily have terminology. I don't think, or like a, a a good mindset around how we approach results and how we can like you know track results or consider results. But I don't think we have a good you know a, a good terminology even even in, in, in a, de a definition of magic you know and I, it, it's one of those issues again it comes back to what we were talking about earlier um of like and, and where we fit in 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 the, the you know the magical worldview and that kind of thing like mm -hmm. where we fit in in the hierarchy uh because if, if we're going by the agrippa um you know our body or whatever is in the natural world but there are we, we're existing on every single level or like some element of right. us is existing on every single level you know it's just like what Area, what, what area or what part are you working with at any one point it's like i think it's like for chino uh I, I think i think it's three books of life actually but he talks about how like the soul 
because it has like the it, it's the only like part of the self that has like momentum in and of itself that can move like it's inherently connected to the world soul and because it's connected mm-hmm. to the world soul we are connected right. to everything everywhere constantly you know it's like so we have to try and factor all this stuff in it's like how do we factor in magical causation or, or causality and how this all works you know it's, it, it's a way bigger question than we can address but but when you're in the moment you don't think about things like that Right, like when you're in the ritual, you like you don't you don't sit there thinking, okay, well, how is it going to work? I'm going to call on Which this part spirit, and, of my and this soul. Is this, you know, this is going to work. It's like, okay, I'm just going to do whatever works, you know, and see what happens, you know. But, um, yeah, I thought about this quite a bit. I think like, uh, because the I, my my brain is sort of split because I, I you know I have astrology half of my brain is astrology, <laughs> and half of this half of it's Afro Cuban, yeah, and I, and I don't think they're necessarily incompatible, but I don't really mix them, hmm. um. But I do, yeah, you know, because of of my Santeria practice, um, because I, I did I did that you know quite a while before I started doing astrology. Mm. Is it allowed me to adopt a magical worldview early in my life? Yeah. Um. So by the time I started taking astrology seriously, I was sort of you know preaching to the choir, I guess. Yeah, well, you were halfway there. Yeah, I was pretty there, but. But the thing is, is that um, I don't know. I think I think that I'm going to sneeze here in a second. Um, allergies. <laughs> um, I, from a, from a from a Santeria standpoint, when you're initiated, you're you're embodied by that Arisha, hmm. and um. And I did notice like there's like an up, you know, I, I don't think this is unique to Santria. I'm just saying this is kind of my experience. But from my experience, I just noticed that things changed uh spiritually for mm-hmm. me. Um, I I suddenly went from not necessarily feeling any sort of like spiritual presence of anything to all of a sudden feeling it. Like I literally feel it viscerally, physically in my body. I can tell it was there. Um, and I didn't know what it was, I had to have it defined to me. I thought mm-hmm. like I didn't think of it as spiritual at first. Um, like chills and yeah, like all, all like the little bodily sensations and the, like, everything yeah. kind of got general sensation field. Yeah. Actually, what it felt like to me was when you uh you know, if if you put something close to your like the middle, like between your eyes, you can sort of feel it before you Oh like well, it's like touching the head ever so slightly and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but you but like, like your your but your skin tingles the only you're not touching anything. That's yeah, what yeah. it feels like. That's what it feels mm. like to me, except it's back here. Mm-hmm. Um, except more intense. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I um, we had this idea in Santeria that's called Ashe, mm. which kind of like the word Smurf means a lot of things. But um, I sort of define it as um, like divine power, mm. and and it's something that all of us have. Right. This is a takeaway I kind of I've ta- I, I use in. Uh, other kinds of magic as well. We we all have like this sort of divine power, but it it doesn't. You know, it's kind of like the the um, a life meter in a video game. It doesn't always stay the same. Mm. Uh, yeah, you, there, there are things you can do to make to make the the make it stronger, and things that you can do to make it weaker. And um, but Santria has like this whole infrastructure built up on how on advice on what you do, what to do to mm. make it stronger, and it's different for each person. Um, this is what you do to make, you know, to, you know, they, they don't say it in ways of making your ashe stronger, but it, that is basically part of the reason. Mm. Um, so if you, there are certain things that you can eat and kinds of behavior that you can do to make things better for yourself and things that you can do to make things worse for yourself. Mm. Um, and when you're strong, like spiritually strong, you don't necessarily have to make as much effort to do what you need to do and things. And when you do things that are overtly magical, they seem to just work better. Mm. Um, and then when things are weak, then you have a harder time. And I think, and to me that that's, that's something that's kind of missing a lot of at least modern Western esotericism is um, we tend to think of things as, as ritual based mm. and the ritual is, you know, it's kind of like lovemaking. It's, it's an act. Yeah. Um, but, but, but it's almost like saying like lovemaking, but not 
you know, but sometimes, you know, sometimes there's like a, a deep spiritual connection with that person. Yeah. And sometimes there is no spiritual connection with that person. And, but the, even though it's the same act, mm-hmm. um, same literal act and it, they feel very different and they have different long-term results <laughs> yeah. in a way. And I don't think there's a lot of effort being spent on trying to understand what that, can mean in a Western standpoint. And I'm not, I don't want to give people the answer to that because I don't pretend to know the answer to that. Sure. Um, but, but I, th- but I do think that we need to sort of think of things as, as think of magic as a day-to-day lived experience. Right. Um, and we have to, this is why I think things like Agrippa and Ficino are so important is that it's not about doing things the way Agrippa or believing what Agrippa believed or what Ficino believed. Right. It's, formulating the right questions for ourselves mm. and then being able to answer that yeah uh in in a in a coherent way mm. and living your life according to that um you know and, and like in santria there's this this i this 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 overarching concept that's called iwa pede which means good character <laughs> and that's that's ultimately what kind of helps 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 you magically as well so what what does good character mean well um you do what you say uh you mm-hmm. don't try to hurt people like, in, like, like it's like integrity and stuff it's integrity you know that kind of thing and that's but that's a big statement i can't just say okay if, if you have integrity you're going to be a better magician yeah sure um but, so a helps. lot of people it helps but at the same time a lot of bad people do a lot of bad things a lot of people do bad things uh that they justify yeah. So if you um, say and, th- and think they're doing it for good yeah. reasons. Yeah. So it's kind of a vague statement, uh, which is why I don't like telling, saying exactly what you need to do. Um, yeah. I know what I need to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, I, and I try to do that. Which be personalized as well, I think, to a certain extent. It, yeah. it is. And, and it, it's I, I think making it personalized is also makes it powerful. It makes it more powerful for you as well. You know, it's like, and it's, it's one of those, I don't know, you see it a lot in, in kind of like the modern like demonolatry like like, like modernized left hand path communities where they're like oh especially who are like obsessed with the goetia or whatever you know they, they come in but like the the beginners who are like very new in this stuff they're like oh which demon can i summon for x right y, whatever right. it is it's like okay one this the, the, the summoning ritual <laughs> is, is like it, this, there is no like core summoning ritual it's like uh, you have like, like an overarching general kind of vibe in the sort of sort of where it's like there are stages to ritual to summoning, you know, from banishing purifications and whatever to licenses. Um, I mean, it just doesn't work like that, you know. It, 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 it's just nope. it, it's a hard thing to like teach early on to people. Like it, it, it's one of those things like you only kind of pick up. Like I think there is a very much kind of a there is the learned tradition of magic where you know you learn it from a book or you learn whatever, but then there's the actual doing lived tradition of magic where it's like and you learn. Right other things and you learn the actual flow of a ritual and the feeling of a ritual more from doing it and experimenting you know um i i i, I like i honestly think that's kind of like what agrippa and Ficino are getting at all the time where it's like they don't necessarily imply that we have to use their correspondences they teach us you know the things like agrippa is a great example like he gives examples of things that are saturnian or martian or jovial or whatever it is but like he also like talks about the ways he's defining those like what qualities are ruled by them and things like that so like it's almost as if he's implying you know that we need to take that model that he's using and then find our own correspondences based on those things he's applying it yeah it's It's applying astrology as like a categorization system almost like if we were to go and you know find some new herb or something in africa that's never been before been studied and like we tasted it which isn't the best idea all the time you know but and it was like bitter or something like that then we could say okay it's martian or saturnian or whatever it is Mm -hmm. you know or, or whatever it is you know and i think people like that's the other issue people kind of fall into like when they start reading agrippa they or, or really any kind of renaissance magic like that where there are correspondences people think they're like hard and fast distinctions but it's like right. you look you look across any of them you know whether it's lily agrippa alberuni or, or any of them like they very rarely agree completely on like what rules what because like everything is kind of ruled by all the planets like it depends they're, what they're quality. going by quality yeah it depends what quality you're looking at like gold is a good example right. like i have this all the time with like when i'm teaching people or talking about planetary magic and like talent and something like that people like they always get really disheartened when they look at like the, the planetary metals 
and they think, oh, well, material wise, you have to use the planetary metals, right? It's like, okay, well then gold for sun, lead for Saturn, whatever it is. It's like, that was the most popular version, but the material doesn't necessarily matter as much. It's more the timing that's more important. That's it's a more huge, like, huge debate. Yeah. It's like a huge <laughs> thing. It's like, I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> But it's a, yeah, it's it, it's a thing. Like I guess what I'm getting at is like people that they, they get really like they get too obsessed. I think with the the classical like seven metals, and they just kind of ignore all the other correspondences that exist because they don't understand that it's a categorization system based on quality. More than what they find out. Itself. Well, they find out a lot of the um, Arabic talismans are made on paper. Yeah, well, paper. Or like like I, I know um, Warnock. Like he like he makes all talismans with. Uh, I think it's like bronze or brass, whatever. Like he just gets like little brass. Brass, I think. Like yeah. I, I think it's brass. Like it doesn't matter what it is. Like it doesn't matter what planet it is. He just uses pure brass for everything. And it's just like like I, I love. I, I just something's funny about it, like the amount of debates that come out about which material to use. And he's just like really nonchalant about the whole thing. He's like, yeah, I just use brass. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> like, right. That, that I mean, it, it's 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 dumb. And I I think there might be. I don't know. Uh, the, the some people will say that paper. Is just a bad material because it doesn't it doesn't stay. Yeah, um, it's like, or it's like it, you're I'm like imbuing like, well, the the talisman with like life, right? Or you're vivifying it like with the planetary intelligence. So because the paper isn't necessarily as like a last, as long lasting as say a stone or be. a metal or whatever. Not everything has to be long lasting either, right? Um, but yeah, it, it it it's just it's it's just idle bullshit, basically. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Um, yeah, you talk about the materials. Was that one thing that I always love that Agrippa says that mm. um that in all that all that in all plants uh Saturn rules roots. Yeah. Um you know um I think like Jupiter rules, leaves, rules flowers, or flowers or whatever. Yeah. Mercury, I think Mercury's leaves, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. Jupiter's a stem, I think. Mm. Um if there's a thorns and that, that kind of thing, it's gonna be Mars. Yeah. Um but yeah, that that's so it's like that, that idea that like all the planets are they actually do rule everything in some way. Mm. Um it's just there's like a a predominance but then you have things like agrippa will have i think sandalwood is ruled by both venus and mars but for yeah. different reasons yeah and um also he differs with the rulerships for like iron right iron is ruled by saturn yeah i guess because he's like earthy right with like earth metal when it sounds i think it's earthy. the smell yeah Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think like it might he be says the, the was it the furnace or the crucible is ruled by Mars as well because it's it's like fiery or hot or right. whatever as well. Yeah. It would, yeah. Um but yeah, it, it's it, it like I, I think that um all all of these are like colors in the palette. Mm. Uh all not, not just rulerships, but I mean just magic in general. These are all colors in the palette. And the if if the if the um if the magician understands what they're doing they could they could do anything like they could use almost anything um if it's if it's directed well mm -hmm. like you can't use anything for any reason but um it's like when you it's like when you paint i mean I'm a, i'll use the painting analogy since i already started it when you paint i like analogies apparently mm. uh but when you paint you you can often uh do a painting with the wrong colors yeah and it looks and it looks right mm. um or you use the wrong colors as part of a bunch of other colors and it looks natural mm. is that too because you can have like for instance you can like um do a skin tone on someone and put blue in it and there are no blue people mm. um and if you do it in the right way it looks like part of the re regular skin tone mm. And so, anyways, but it's sort of, so magic is sort of the same way. You can you can be more fluid with the things that you're doing if you're doing it in the right way for the right reasons. But yeah. I don't really recommend people start there mm. uh, because you don't know what you're doing yet. Yeah, um, and I, I've seen I've seen plenty of examples. I mean, as, you know, especially in my Santeria practice of oh, you just don't have this thing, and you just like intelligently use use um substitutions not you just you just don't like use willy-nilly anything that's there mm. there's like a logic that you're doing you still have to you still have to use your logic yeah and you um, you, you use the context of the methodology like, i i i have the same thing with like the pgm right so the greek the greek magical empire it's like and like the greek magical empire is a bit it's like it's a bit unique in that it's, it's like it's a really weird situation you have with it a lot of the time i found where it's like 
you have like say in, in one papyrus because they because it's a compilation it's a heterogeneous collection uh you'll have like multiple rituals for the same goal or like, that give you the same result but the materials and the description will be completely different and like one of the things that's like really weird about the pgm is sometimes the rituals will be like really analytically described it'll be like okay face this direction use this material mm-hmm. at this time all this kind of thing and then like two pages on from like, that or like two things down in, in the papyri you'll have the same ritual or a ritual that gives the same result and it'll be one sentence long you know and right. like then the question becomes like hey well then what's the incentive for doing a longer ritual there with all the other materials if it's the same result like, there's something missing there that we don't necessarily know but like the advantage of it is that like you can just look intelligently to like all the different correspondences and look at like what role the material is playing you know it's like mm-hmm. the common example is like uh with helios for example right uh, and it's in the chain of being you know think think that kind of way but it's like it, and there are a couple of rituals in the pgm quite a few that say like when you're doing like divination with helios or whatever you need to like sacrifice a rooster or like a cockerel mm-hmm. or something like that because it's it's solar right it rises with the sun whatever it is it's like but then you get the modern practitioners coming in they're like well i don't want to sacrifice a rooster and also i can't like i have no idea where to get a rooster it's like okay well then look to the other rituals there and substitute something in the same chain of being that, that's also solar like because the, the cockerel the rooster is serving solar purpose mm-hmm. you know so fine perhaps else right and like find something else that's solar <laughs> or serving solar you know frankincense gold whatever it is or, or some other kind of animal that's easier to get a hold of and you want to look at it in terms of whatever purpose it's serving and then make intelligent substitutions and same kind of thing but we don't necessarily know the mechanics of why that works yet you know that, and that, like, the well, is kind of interesting with that but well on top of that we have this illusion that modern practitioners have that the text that is written down in a book is somehow definitive yeah yeah i mean we don't have definitive books today <laughs> yeah it's it's, it's, all, it's it's all interpretation and personalized yeah it's, it's personalized ritual yeah it, it's really it's funny as hell yeah <laughs> uh it just it just we don't know what people didn't write down i mean it's it's yeah. uh that, that that's that again that's my complaint with picatrix is that um i mean for, for all intent there, there's a lot of reasons that are i think are both good and bad that people do this Mm. Um, but a lot of the ceremonies are basically just, you know, kind of, you know, typical rituals. I mean, there, there, you, you have incense and candles and <laughs> you have a prayer and, uh, which are different than what the Picatrix says. I'm not also not ex- saying that people should sacrifice a rooster. Mm. Um, and there are many reasons why I think most people should not do that. Yeah. But, um, um, but, but to sit there and have this illusion that you're doing things directly by the book. I mean, what does that even mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, well, the magicians have always done the best they could. Yeah. Really. Well, it's, it, it's one of those things I think like the, it's like almost, I don't know what's the word. Like, I, I, I remember like the word that's coming to me right now, the name that's coming to me, it's like survivorship bias almost. But it's like, yeah, it's, it's like one of those weirder things where it's like the more familiar an author is with like something or the mechanics of a ritual or material, the less likely they are to write it down. Because it's kind of just like the whole idea of like, oh, well, right. this is common knowledge. You know, like we, we all know what to do. It's like, so again, something like the PGM, for example, right? They don't write down the do the usual. Or like, it's really annoying because they just write do the usual. You know, it's like, they open the ritual, end the ritual, do the usual. Then here's the stuff you add on top of the usual. Like, but we don't know what the usual is because we're not in right. that context. Like, we don't have any idea about what that is, you know? And that's, like, an, that's another important point, yeah. too, because we tend to be more complete in our writing today. Yeah. because um books are cheap mm. and and it's and it's most of us are um and at least in the west are literate enough to to kind of detail things out mm. uh and it's it ta- it's it, it takes nothing to type something out at microsoft word and print it out right um but back then you're thinking about paper being expensive less people be being literate and um so what what do you, what what's what is going to be your motivation for writing down something mm. and your motivation is mostly going to be to write down things that people are going to forget mm. um if it's something you're going to remember all the time then you know why you write it down like your usual example um it's sort of the same thing um and that that kind of goes into my argument with astrology is that a lot of the astrology that we have a i think it's an accident in history that we even have uh, the the number of astrological books we have Mm. because 
you know, we don't, we don't even know all the, the different kinds of, of like divinations that were done. Yeah. Um, I mean, liver divination was probably more popular than astrology, but we have no, yeah, it's, it's all the rage everywhere. Yeah. Right. Uh, every, simply everyone was doing it. Mm. Um, but we, we don't have any books on that. Mm. And it just so happens we have all these astrology books. So, mm. you know, it's created this kind of um, exaggeration on its cultural importance. Um, we don't know what normal people did or mm. believed about it. Um, I mean, there are arguments, uh, especially in the ancient world. There are some arguments against it, but I don't know. It's just a lot of this is accents in history. That uh, I remember what first turned me on to that was, I think it was um, Ben Dykes was saying that a lot of the English terms we use for astrology is it's just an accent of history because certain books use certain words. Yeah. And we just, but the fact of the matter is there's other words mm. for the same thing. Um, so I, th- I think that practices are very similar. Yeah. Like um, a, yeah, like across the board, you know, and, and like, I, I feel like, especially in, in, in sort of like, medi- if you take medieval astrology, for example, like the way a lot of it was like, a lot, a lot of the communities were so interconnected and they were, they were trading and there was this, this, you know, this hermeneutic kind of exchange between Arabic sources, Latin sources, everything like that. It does kind of necessitate a shared vocabulary almost the people like they know what they're talking about so people are using similar words in the very least or they have similar concepts that can translate over well enough um but i do think like i think it's a problem more widely in general just with like the current form of western magic or western as the western esoteric tradition where it's like and it's i mean i mean you, you could probably comment this or comment on this better than i can because you're still part of um Santeria and things like that which are living traditions you know they have mm-hmm. an active living relationship with spirits a lot more or like or any kind of african diasporic religions or cuban religions or anything like that um but like a lot of the the western tradition right now especially the spirits in the grimoire traditions it is like I, i'm hesitant to say it's a dead tradition because it's not dead people are practicing it but it's like i wouldn't say it's dead but no no but like a lot of the a lot of the spirits are like they're locked kind of within grimoires you know and, and like it's it's convoluted enough it, it's difficult for like the average practitioner to approach spirits without having a background in grimoire traditions or anything like that it's like there is a level of inaccessibility i think with spirits in the western tradition because it's not necessarily a, a, a again it, it's not that it's not a living tradition because it is alive and it is what it, people are practicing it but it's like in comparison to something like African diasporic religions, you know, where they they have very like lived experience of working with spirits on a daily basis, you don't ne- you don't necessarily have that in the grimoire tradition with planetary spirits or, or demons mm-hmm. or anything like that, because they're kind of locked behind these very kind of you know high, you know, intellectual kind of grimoires and things like that. So we do need to kind of begin moving in some capacity to like a revival of like lived Western magic, I suppose. Is what it, I'm trying to say when you, when you think about it. Um... For the longest, if you're talking, if you're talking about Solomonic magic mm. specifically, when you think about it, the the percentage wise, <laughs> um, there are a lot more people doing it now, yeah. Than, um, I guess, any time in the last few hundred years, at least, yeah. um, and um, so what that means is, we. I, I think that this like the the sort of um lived experience part of it is really new. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm more interested to see what what what's gonna be what it's gonna be like in 20 years. Uh yeah. because because now you have a lot I, I know I know I personally know of a couple of people who've been working with these for quite a long time. Yeah. Um sort of before it was before it was cool. And um they have a much different experience than yeah. what you tend to hear on the internet. Yeah. Um, I, I, it's always been there. Really what it comes down, all of this comes down to is a being open to a personal experience mm. and then having a lot of years in that. Yeah. Um, that, that, it's that combination. So your average, not, not to talk down to 20 year olds, but, um, but, but there's a newness to it. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the, that you can, you can be talented and young. Um, and, and do some really cool shit, <laughs> mm. but the, but when you start having 20, 30 years in something, it starts to change and rich mat- and mature in its own way. Yeah. And, um, I, we haven't reached that point, um, as a culture yet. 
Mm. Uh, where, you know, as the African, I mean, you you just have this sort of uh, like unbroken. Even the slave trade didn't break it up. Mm. Um, it changed a lot. I mean, the 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 like Santeria does not look like. Um, actually, I don't think any African practice looks like the way it did before the slave trade, even in Africa. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's it it just changed too much. Um, but um, so there's so there's no illusion here of things being the same mm. and that's not going to happen with Solomonic magic either um but i, I know i know that I, I know there are some people who are a little bit newer to this who i think are doing some pretty um profound and interesting things mm. because they've kind of let themselves be open yeah to the experience itself and not being tied to the book mm. So it's not just pretty an age thing, but I, def- I definitely think there's a there's an there's an attitude you have to have, and um and not everybody has that attitude. Um, so like you know, just being open to like as you were saying when you were doing your um election, um that these things were happening around you, hmm. and just starting and noticing that, um that that might say a lot. I mean, we don't know what that means, as far as um the worldview part of it. Hmm. But um, but being open to like those things around you, yeah, and being able to use that actively is is you know I mean there are, there are people doing that. Uh, I don't think the book is the answer. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, the books books are there to get you started to be a guide, but people people hang on the books too much. Yeah, as much as I love books. Mm. Yeah, I I think there is a like. I don't know, like, like I don't know. It, it, it's it's a thing, especially with translators in general, because um, like translating, like translators are kind of their own authority on certain things. You know, translating. I think translators do have a lot of power in in how how they translate things across languages. Absolutely, I, I'm drunk with power too. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> it's like yeah, because like because um, people like um, well, the Hanagraph at like Amsterdam University have talked about this. It's like because he's yeah. like translating a lot of the Hermetic stuff. You know, um, like there is an entire like hermeneutic art to how you translate it, it's a process of allowing the text to speak to you and then but mm-hmm. you also speaking to the text as well like you finding like yes the accurate words for the translation but also finding the right kind of words to capture the meaning and the feel that the original author has it's like it's one of the issues that you have with agrippa and like i think modern modern occultists who don't read latin struggle with this it's like agrippa's latin is really good like agrippa is like, it was, like yeah i got spoiled yeah. Yeah, like Agrippa is like it's really pleasurable to read his Latin. Like he, like his, his he has like an insane command. And I, like, and then I, I think I can't remember where I read something like isn't um like early on in his like teenage years, didn't he like troll people and like only talk to them in Latin or something? Right. Yeah, um, I heard about that. Like he, he knows, like he knows Latin so well that like he would like like you know bolster his intellectual superiority. Like I can speak only Latin to you, and then, like you just piss a load, a load of people off with it. Um. But I think like there are sometimes there are sometimes can be things lost in translating into English because Latin is also you know the way the verb conjugations and now you know the, the um, declensions whatever work like it, it's hard to do that uh, I mean yeah um what one of the one of the words I struggled with um I had to do a pretty big footnote on it was um the three parts of the soul was um mm. um it was uh soul reason and idolum not not in that it's order. Like, in, like image i guess well idolum is so idolum in latin means i can literally mean idol mm. or image um and jf translated it as sense and it's that in sense is technically correct mm. but okay. that's all he it's says like, is yeah. sense yeah like but, like, like it misses something i guess yeah it misses something and i so i had to make this decision do i use sense do i use idol idol sounds weird because mm, like, it, it would imply it almost like a like a ritual idol almost right or at least or at least a mental um image mm. and but that doesn't even tell you what the word is yeah and so because idolum is supposed to be the lowest part of the soul mm. and it's the uh, a facino called to the feet of the soul mm. and um it's the part like if you have the chain of being that the the lowest link lowest part of the link is the idolum but that mm. links with the highest part of the chain below it 
Um, and so I ended up leaving it untranslated with a footnote okay, explaining yeah. all of it hmm. because it, because the no English translation, well, even though the, the words are correct, hmm. um, it, the, the word gets swallowed up as a term. Yeah. So if I said sense or idol, it would look awkward, but correct, but it wouldn't stick out as like a unique term. Mm. So I left it untranslated. Yeah. So uh, what, what, do, what do you think? Like, what do you think he means by it? Is it like, is it sense as in like imaginative perception or, or what? Yeah, I think I think it's meant to be like a more the more bodily. This is where I think sense is actually correct, because mm. a sense is um, in, in all of its all senses of the word um, is, is, is when you take something as incorporeal mm. and it becomes more, more corporeal. Like yeah. if you smell something, you're, you're basically experiencing viscerally something that isn't physical. Right. Mm. So if you smell cinnamon, I mean, the yeah. Simmons there. And then, so like, maybe it, it's it translates, example, but... Like, but your brain translates it into into right. like the, the unified sensation of, of, of the smell of it. It's it's like very weirdly like modern cognitive science. It's like it's like the whole like qualia. It's like the hard problem of consciousness. Like how, why right. does our, our brain like translate like seemingly independent sensations into one unified thing? You know, it's like it's very like weirdly cognitive. <laughs> but I think it's an important like that whole idea is, is so important because that's where like books like the Kabbalion. Mm. Uh, lose, 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 loses itself is because they talk about the mind mm. a lot, and a lot of like New Age thought talks about the mind, but th they their their view of the mind is very different. They they try to have a very kind of like lofty you know way of speaking about mind. Yeah, at the end of the day, they're talking about your brain a lot of times. Yeah, <laughs> or maybe maybe your imagination, but um, but when you talk about mind. In the early early material, it it becomes something more divine. Mm. Um, it's it's a connection to the divine, basically, is what 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 your mind is, mm. and so your it's it's your mind connecting to the mind of the divine, um, and that that's what like you know that's what divination is. That's that's part of what magic is. That's probably the activating force of magic is that connection. Um, mm. And uh, so it becomes it, it becomes a much different statement when you start taking like when you I guess like when you kind of open up these definitions a little bit you know uh, I th I think it was the sense of what they're I kept using the word sense it's the sense of what he's what they're talking about is this it's it's like it's the, your your uh, your body and your experience viscerally experiencing something that is not corporeal yeah. <laughs> I suppose we're doing the yeah. same thing, right? So even there, when 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 we're using the word sense, we are trying to translate whatever non-corporeal thought and idea that they had in their, you know, their their divine intellect, whatever it is, into a sensation or an understanding we have. So it, it's it's even when we use the word sense colloquially, it's mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a, approaching the same thing, right? In the same way right, that they exactly. are. They're saying, you know, they're, same way that they're saying, okay, sense is, is the lowest part of the soul. And it, it's, you know, it, it translates all these things. We're doing the same thing when we use the word sense. We're trying to translate their meaning, which is inherently an abstract concept, maybe even a divine concept, into something that is sensible and understandable to us. You know, so we're using it in the same context. It's really interesting. We are. And at the same time, though, like like I said, like I said earlier, like this, that the, the modern mind tends to think of things of, like when you use things like... Uh, words like symbolic mm. or abstract or imagination we tend to th think of those as not real yeah um but from an ancient mind uh, a symbol isn't just like oh this is just a drawing to remind us of something there's something more to that mm. um there's there is a reality to it yeah. and the fact that you that the fact that you can draw this like abstract shape um and then have your mind apprehend it with a bigger meaning you mm. know it's like you know today you look at a stop sign you know there's no inherent meaning to the shape of a stop sign that mm. tells you to stop <laughs> yeah but we, we, we all unanimously like, across the world regardless of culture know that like red hexagon means stop yeah right um but yet you know we see this abstract shape and we all do the same thing mm. you know 
Um, in a modern way, we would look at that as like, oh, we've just learned it and it's that's symbolic. But in the, in the ancient world, that would be like, well, no, that's just inherently what that shape is. <laughs> it's real. Yeah. So that's yeah. Like I suppose, yeah, because there's like I, I mean, it's, still, it's it's also very platonic, but I and also have Griffin, but like it's that idea of degrees of reality, you know, so like the symbolic speaks to a different degree and it, like it is very kind of vertical in terms of the hierarchy right like and at least if we're going by the neoplatonic standard but the 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 the, the degrees of reality that exist you know there are different areas of it are, are affected by different symbols and different symbola you know well uh, yeah the, the that's one of the things i've always ranted about with signs uh the mm. astrological signs yeah is you know people mix those up with and basically say that they're um, the stars themselves, the constellations, mm. but that that was, but in the early days, that never really was the point. The 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 signs are essentially part of the like the the forms, the platonic forms. Mm. Uh, the 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 signs are invisible and exist above the stars. Mm. Yeah, so they're, they're, so, not, they're not the physical stars and physical constellations, but like the physical right. constellations are, I guess, the natural world equivalent of the celestial forms or the intellectual, the form. corporeal, yeah. Um, expression mm. of the celestial for the uh the 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 form the divine form of the sign so like when you think about even you know even by the time you get to agrippa um you know when they, when you talk about the 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 way divine influence filters down to the physical world um you know it starts with you know god having a thought mm. yeah, and that goes down the to idea, the forms yeah. the idea and then it goes down to the forms and it goes down to the intelligences. And then that, you know, that kind of filters down to planets and blah, 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 blah. Mm. And um, um, I don't know. I've just had that. I've, I've ranted about this. So it's like, you know, so the signs, you can't see them and touch them, but they're real. There's the, the you know, according to that platonic idea, the forms are like the most basic form of being. So mm. they are real. You just can't see them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to remember like the. It, it's in the Republic. He talks about it. I think like Socrates talks about it, like the, the allegory of the divided line, uh, where he like he looks he like juxtaposes like the ontology of like all the, like all the layers of existence with the epistemology of like how we know them, and it's like I can't mm -hmm. like I don't know what he uses. It's like it's it's so yeah it, it's it's noose i think so like it, it's like the mm -hmm. awareness or the consciousness there and even that's like a, a harder translation because noose is another one of those words we, we can't really translate it very well in greek because it means so many different right. things in context um it's like noose is the thing that allows us to comprehend the forms you know and it's like it's so far above like the general images and the idol of the of the day that we see down here it's like but it, it's not just perceptive knowing that's the thing it's like it's, it's like the it's the distinction between like knowledge and gnosis you know like people often like it's right. a really challenging thing that you see people kind of doing when you're, when you're translating ancient greek texts um like yeah it's the same kind of thing as like translating eidolon it's like gnosis like yes technically it's true if you translate it, it's accurate if you translate it as knowledge but like it's not knowledge in the same sense as like reading from a book and knowing something because right. knowledge is more of something that's learned, right? And Whereas like, gnosis is something like that's something not that's like internally revealed. You know, it's, it's right. like it's like an it's not even a really intuitive perception. It's like it's deeper than intuition. It's like it's like an it, it's, it's a knowledge that exists on its own. Yeah, in, yeah, a, in a way that that's not something you you um take a course in. Right. It's like it's not something <laughs> to, like to you know. can kind of like like it's like I don't know, it's like that distinction between I can't remember which dialogue it is for Plato where he talks about like the distinction between like knowledge being subject and object, where it's like is like is like a field the study of knowledge or is knowledge the study of a field? Where it's like all knowledge is just remembering. Like the more you go into a field, the more you study something and expand it, you're not mm -hmm. actually learning any learning anything new. You're just remembering and like giving more room for like that form of knowledge to like expand itself inside your mind basically um and it, it's that whole whole it's a whole other debate and it's like all knowledge is remembering so gnosis is just like internal revelation through remembering and it's like it, it, it's it, it's the whole issue with noose and translating it like we can't translate it especially even if you go into like hermetic sources noose means something completely different than right. in like regular greek sources you know and it's like i use the example i i, I think well the hanographers uses example as well where it's like it's like when like imagine like 100 200 years in the future like some 
linguist or translator is like trying to translate like a Deepak Chopra book into like their language and they see him using like the word quantum for like quantum healing and all this kind of thing and then they try and like apply like the scientific definition of quantum to how he's using the word quantum in that context of his audience it doesn't make any sense because like he's well, using the that, word completely differently we have that problem now with the word science right exactly yeah because like well because yeah. i think it's, it's, it's like it's science is kind of like it's become like this like golden cow like everyone's just kind of milking and using it as like a definitive thing where it's like it's a methodology it doesn't translate over it, it's, well. it's a methodology but the 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 um the, the original sense of the word like in latin uh scintia means it does mean knowledge mm. speaking of knowledge um but it implied the kind of knowledge that is learned like through rules and principles and things like yeah. that yeah, like the experimentation um, and stuff yeah which is why astrology from an ancient definition i'm not talking about opinion i'm talking about definition mm. um is a science uh mm. mathematics is a science um, but but in a modern standpoint, astrology can never be a science, right? Because like it doesn't follow those principles. Science is like that atheistic materialist as well. It's like it's incompatible. Well, with it. But more more specifically, um, it's 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 require it requires like a a, um, a rationality and a process and a re repeatability that astrology doesn't have, hmm. and because it doesn't have that, it can't really be scientific. But astrology, because it does use um certain mathematical and certain astronomical principles it still does even if even if astrology is um unrealistic from a scientific standpoint it still uses some things that are scientific because we have planets and stars and regardless of what your opinion is of tropical versus sidereal and any, any mm -hmm. this other stuff um the fact of the matter is as you can still i mean the planets are still tracked through this you know very similar math um even though it's geocentric mm. Um, I mean, from a, you know, you can still track a planet across the sky using right. a geocentric or a, or a heliocentric, you know. Right. And yeah, this is like, it's kind of why like, I so don't, it's, I don't think it matters so much where it's like, even though all the traditional systems are geocentric, it's like from, if you take the perspective of like, you're looking at the world from a human perspective, like it is like from our lived experience, it is kind of a geocentric worldview because we live right. on Earth and we're looking out. You know, it's like things like the Chaldean order. It's like it may not be scientifically accurate in the context of the universe, you know, but it's like it like the order's still accurate because it, it's but, it's but, measure, it's measuring like the the orbit speed of the planets from like slowest to the fastest, right? And it goes down. So like from your but in a way, it's still down here. It's still accurate. But it, but it's still scientific accurate, scientifically accurate in some ways because right. it is still using, like, we can still use the same math to track to track to track the position of planets. Right. The esoteric part of it is the way that we conceptualize it. Mm, yeah, conceptualize. My, my point yeah. being is yeah. that it's a mixture. It's, in reality, there's a, there's a mixture happening, but everybody's trying. Like, not everybody. But some people are trying mm. to say, well, no, it's actually scientific because, well, there are planets and stars and things like that. Mm. Um, we don't do that with tarot cards. I mean, tarot cards are physical. Mm. We know where they come from. Um, but we don't have this argument about whether it's scientific or not mm. with it. Um, and and it, we're essentially kind of doing the same thing with astrology. We're using these physical objects. Um, that no one argues whether they're real or not. We know that there is a moon. <laughs> mm, yeah. And we can still scientifically track that and astrologically track it, but but astrology conceptualizes it as conceptualizes it in a way that's never going to be scientific. Mm. Um and, and it's not really that important, honestly. I, I don't think it's that it's it's even important. Yeah. Um we, we don't need th everything to be scientifically explained. Uh, you know, just to paraphrase that movie, uh, contact, mm. the Carl Sagan book yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with, uh, Jodie Foster and all that. Well, she's supposed to be a skeptic, uh, a scientific skeptic. And she has a relationship with Matthew McConaughey, who's a reverend or a preacher. Mm. And they're arguing about, um, reality versus not. And, and, uh, so she's, so she, he asked her, do you love your father? And she said, yes. And he said, prove it. Mm. And 
you know, love is something we've all all experienced and it's been real to us, but you can't, I mean, it doesn't, we don't require proof though as, yeah. as people. And astrology is like most divination systems. Um, you can't, you can't just say that if, you know, Mercury is trying Mars, then it always, it's always going to mean this thing. You can't say that. Mm. You, you can, you can say that there's a principle that, you know, there's a, there's a character to that aspect, mm. but it's not always going to um, um, manifest the same way for all people. So you're, so you're, you're going to be using your imagination in some way. That's a very unpopular thing to say amongst astrologers, but yeah. but you have to use your imagination in some way to conceptualize this. That conceptual mm. that, that conceptualize conceptualize I can't say it conceptualization. Um, you know, in, in my opinion, is is that link between you and the divine, mm. uh, informing what it is that you say. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's like I, I I think we were saying earlier that. You know, some of the old texts will say that if you have a certain planetary configuration, then it means you're going to be torn apart by wild animals, or you're going to mm. fall off of a of a building or something, or a building's going to fall on you. That was popular. Yeah, yeah. Um, building codes didn't exist yet, <laughs> and um, so you can you can read that text. I do all the time. I've been doing an experiment. Of, uh, I've been experimenting with this actually. But you read these texts; it'll say something like that, and. Um, but you have to tell yourself when you're speaking to a real life human being, mm. what is that going to mean? Yeah. Um, and you're not, you're not, I'm not going to tell the client you're going to be torn apart by wild animals. Yeah. Um, so, so you have to be a good your... return customers either. <laughs> no, but so you have to, you have to like, you know, use your, the magician's imaginative spirit <laughs> yeah. to translate that in some way. And you have to ask questions and you have to kind of have a dialogue and things like that. Mm. Um, so it, it is not scientific in that way, you know? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of modern people, modern astrologers are going to say that, you know, a planetary configuration saying you're going to be torn apart by wild animals is not scientific anyway. Mm. Um, that's, that's, that's cherry picking, honestly, yeah. but, um, but I don't know. It's just like, you know, it, the, the, the point of all the, all these divinations is, is, is to, is to, um, take these pr these principles and apply that in some way that applies to the person. Uh, hmm. We see that, with, I see that with the uh, Santeria readings. Uh, we have 256 signs. Hmm. And, um, and, and, you know, to, originally each sign was uh, some aphorisms and, and, and some stories that, and in, in the very old days, that's, that's how you did a reading. You would just tell stories hmm. and tell these and say these aphorisms. And yeah. it was up to the person getting the reading to figure out what it meant. Yeah. Um, today they actually give advice, uh, but but at, at its core, that's that's what these are. These are stories. Mm. And if you think about like in astrology, it's essentially the same idea. It's like we're you know, we we laugh about like the being tor torn apart by animals thing, but you know, a it can still happen. But b it's a, it's it's a principle. What what yeah. things does Mars Mars is maybe you know maybe it's Mars. What what does Mars rule? What does Mars rule in the chart? This is a difficult configuration. What does this mean for the person? Um, I, I think astrologers have always been doing that, but we try to like make things so concrete all the time today. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's also interesting because like I've I've seen like I don't know I, I don't know if it's just like a, a a major distinction between traditional astrology and modern or like that modern astrologers haven't looked into traditional sources too much you know and I, I don't want to claim either way it's like a lot of the like a lot of the core working principles and philosophies behind why astrology works the way it does in traditional astrology are missing in modern astrology like i've never really heard a lot of or like very very few i've heard very few modern astrologers talk about things like the chain of being or the platonic ideas or the forms or something like that. Very few. Yeah, I've seen a couple though. Yeah, I mean, like Not it's many. changing a bit, but like it's it, like yeah. like if you look on like you know the popular like YouTube videos or anything like that, like of what like modern astrologers do, um, 
like there's there's no discussion of like the, the forms or, or the chain of being or the world soul no. or anything like that um and like the people tend towards and i don't i don't know if, if it's just like a general western civilization because again like you're saying you know people try to make it too concrete and through the lens of different sciences but it's like they try and find like materialist explanations for astrology it's like oh well the planets are affecting you by gravitational waves or electromagnetic waves that right. are coming to you and it's like Mm, no. it's not, it isn't helpful it isn't yeah. helpful and it also doesn't help you all if you try to be pseudoscientific about it like that and saying okay it's gravity then why why does the gravity of venus cause love yeah you know what's the explanation for that yeah and you know versus the the gravity of mars causing war <laughs> yeah it's it's yeah it, it just it's like a weird like movement for me that i see in like modern astrologers when they try and like legitimize astrology through material lenses and it just doesn't it doesn't stack up you know but the thing is even like ideas like like forms i mean you don't you know we as modern people we can we can look at a chair and understand that um and understand that like the, the chair was a result of crafts people using a time honored um design that we mm. know works really well to sit in Mm. Um, but at the same time, you can look at the idea of a form as, you know, and, 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 and it as an intellectual construct mm. to make us recognize the chair as a chair. Yeah. And those, the, all these things could exist simultaneously. I think they always have, um, mm. you know, I'm, I'm sure Plato really didn't feel the need to talk about, um, how craftspeople have figured out this, like really awesome and efficient system of making chairs. I mean, mm. there's no need to write about that in a philosophical oh. book. Um, and, um, um, but, you know, but people want these like really simple, like sound bitey answers to things. And, um, uh, what was I, what was going to say, um, that, oh yeah, that what, one of the things like, like in astrology, um, you know, we, it's easy for us to explain. Um, I mean, my, my assumption, which I don't think I'm that far off, um, is that when we looked at the significations for the original uh, seven planets, mm. you know, I'm sure that the process was somewhere along the line of there's this one planet, which is really dim and really slow. And it kind of reminds me of old people. Mm. Yeah. Well, so like this, Mars, you know, Mars is red. It's the color of blood. And, and exactly. Whatever, so Yeah. So I'm sure that was that was that was some of the original logic, and it kind of grew from there. Yeah. And yes, we know that the Mesopotamians um, spent a lot of time uh, writing down observations, mm. and that's real. I mean, the, these things did happen, and uh, and then we also know that these observations and the system was um, sort of uh, combined with Hellenistic culture. We know that happened, mm. but. So the, these are all things we can explain, but like, you know, and I, I had this, I said this one time online and, and, and um, someone argued with me about this because it's online. Everybody always argues. Yeah. But I said, there are certain things that are, that, that are in a certain concepts in astrology are not based on observation. Hmm. Um, because I don't think they can be. And the, the, for me, the main example are the, uh, the lots. Hmm. Um, and for those who don't know lots, they're also called Arabic parts, um, which are basically mathematical, uh, points on a chart based on certain planets. Um, oh, like, like, like the, El like the Elmatez and stuff like that. That's a different one, but yeah, same, same kind of a thing, but okay. the, the lots are something they've been, they've been used since at least the beginning of astrological books. Hmm. I, don't, I don't know how far they go back. But it's interesting that, you know, if you have like a lot of father, you take either Saturn or the sun, depending on if it's a day or night chart, hmm. and you take the degrees between that and the ascendant. I'm sorry, you take the degrees from, I'm sorry, you take the degrees between Saturn and, and the sun. Hmm. Then you take that number of degrees and add that to the ascendant. That gives you the lot of father. Hmm. Um, it depends on whether you like, it's either going to be, um, it's either going to be based on the, on the, the position of the sun being the primary planet versus Saturn or vice versa, depending on the chart. But, 
Um, but anyway, it gives you a number of degrees. You add that to the ascendant. That gives you a place of the chart. That's the lot of father. And that degree has something to say about your father. Hmm. And that cannot be based on observation. Right. In my opinion. The reason why that works is because it's supposed to work. Hmm. <laughs> Right. Um, it's it, 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 it like a like meaning sense. behind it, something. Yeah. Yeah. It philosophically makes sense. Mm. And I guess because had... Saturn, Saturn rules fathers and grandfathers and stuff. And then the sun is Saturn like, and the you? sun both rule yeah. fathers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Once, like, basically, this, uh, the according to the older text, uh, the sun rules father and day charts, Saturn and night charts. Mm. Okay. Um, and anyway, uh, but it works because it's supposed to work and it's a philosophical philosophically valid point in the in the chart mm. and but it works you could actually yeah. make predictions based on this mm. so um th- to me that kind of blows this is 100 percent observation because mm. you can't you can't look I, I don't know how you would observe that yeah because yeah, you can't um, like count the degrees based on observation like you have to like look at like a a, a chart or whatever for that right you you would have to I don't know. You'd have to take the significations for someone's father and locate that as a as an abstract degree in the chart, mm. and then triangulate that somehow to a certain planetary to certain planets. Yeah, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, it. I mean, you always use the easiest explanation. The easiest explanation is that Saturn and the Sun signify fathers and you're going to do some funny math mm. based on that. And uh, so my point is that um, is that you have these like things that are absolutely, you know, some parts of astrology I think are unquestionably based on observation. Mm. Um, some of it isn't. I mean, yeah. we don't, we don't even like, you know, the, in the, in the essential dignities, we don't even know a hundred percent how the, uh, the terms the bounds yeah. are derived. Now, I think someone knew how, how they were at some point. We mm-hmm. just don't know today what it is. Yeah. But it's not that's not observation. I the the, the dignities, for instance, are ba- like are largely based on an observ- on a on a combination of astrono- astrological no- uh, logic, astronomical logic, mm. and then Thema Mundi. Usually, some combination of those three things, right? Um, the uh, the terms are kind of a mystery with that, but uh, but anyway, my point is is that is that usually there's a logic with all this, and some of it's going to be observational, some of it isn't. Yeah. Um, and I think it's easy to like say that, you know, if the Mesopotamians were tracking the movements of planets and then writing down events that were happening making correlations based on that makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um the lots don't work don't don't make sense. Hmm. In that in the, in, the, in the same way they don't. Yeah. Uh yet we use them. Yeah, well, yeah so I mean are, are, are the lots of Mesopotamian development or do they, did they come later? You don't know for sure. Yeah, okay. You don't know for sure. Um the earliest um as far as I know the earliest records are are Hellenistic. Mm. But that doesn't mean they invited they invented it. Yeah, because they they could, they could be Egyptian anyway. for all we know. Mm. We don't we don't know. Yeah, hmm. it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I, I, yeah. I know the origins of all. I mean, like, I think a lot of astrology probably is Egyptian, but we don't really have any records on what the Egyptians did. Yeah, well, this this is yeah. Uh, it's a weird thing because like even the the Dendro zodiac, right? That's, that's Ptolemaic. Right, it, it's which it's, is Ptolemaic, right? It's Hellenistic. Yeah, it, it's it's all late stage, which is it, it's all Hellenistic, right? So people we, people often use it like, oh, well, the Egyptians had a whole zodiac. It's like, no, they like no. the Egyptian zodiac is Hellenistic. Right. Well, and the rea- oh, you're, bre- so you're breaking up. Um, oh, like you broke up there like, for they, a they second. Also, sorry, like, from what I remember, I, like, I really should know this more. I like, I don't know. My my connection was I went out. I was like that. Um. From what I remember, like I really should know this better because my degree was in archaeology. I basically focused on Egypt. I really should know more like now. Um, but Uh-oh. we have, I mean, yeah, I, I'm putting myself on the spot. Yes, <laughs> um, you are. We have, um, <laughs> yeah, but we we have um, like the, the most like 
important thing that we have in, in Egyptian astrology is the rising of Sothis, right? So it, it's the rising mm-hmm. of Sirius. Like, and that that's one of the like the clear indications that they were monitoring some kind of heliacal rising and that kind of thing. Um, outside of some early papyri about astronomical knowledge, it's it's kind of weird. Like we have comparatively much less astrological and astronomical knowledge from Egyptians than we do from like Hellenistic cultures or Mesopotamian. Except the Deccans. The Deccans are Egyptian. Yeah, the, the Deccans are, are distinctly Egyptian, but it's like as well, even with the Deccans, it's like they are like before they were an astrological system, they were a timekeeping system. Like they, they were right. a means of of dividing up the Egyptian month into, into basically like they're kind of like the, the Egyptian equivalent of a week. Basically, like the, 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 the Egyptian week was like ten days long, right? And and that's what the, the, the Deccan was basically used as, as a way of dividing up the week as a timekeeping system. And and that's like, still it naturally kind of progressed into astrology from there. And that's still projected onto the Hellenistic zodiac, though. Yeah, which is still different than what the Egyptians did. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I I think about that a lot. I mean, like I I do think. Uh, I mean, a lot of people have theorized that when when they say Hellenistic, it's it's probably or possibly largely alexandrian which really means it's a combination of you know greeks and mesopotamians and jews and egyptians and a whole a whole lot of people yeah. uh mixing mixing a lot of knowledge together mm. i think it's kind of reasonable um at least as far as its origins go mm. um but yeah it's uh <laughs> but um i don't know where that that was kind of leading, but yeah um I, I always wonder about things like terms yeah, the, the terms though, if that's some like strange timekeeping system mm. that got grafted onto the zodiac. Yeah, yeah, and well, again, like it, it's it's interesting now. I, I'm I'm just remembering because we had we had a discussion earlier about that, right? About how like the time itself is magical, right? The timing in which was magical, like like a large a part of me was like often wonders here, like did a lot of this actually start out as a means of magical timekeeping. You know, it's like whether whether it's for timing rituals or timing events or festivals, whatever it is. But it's like, you know, whether it's electional astrology, like you're using it for for timing things, whatever it is. But it's like a lot of it began maybe as a means to like look at the meet, look at the movements of the planets, and look at how they were mm-hmm. influencing time events and things in here. Um, it's like it, it's it's a thing in Babylonian and Mesopotamian astrology a lot more, where it's like in comparison to like the Hellenistic astrology where the planets kind of are gods so or they're you know understood to be gods in the Mesopotamian stuff the planets are not strictly gods they're like the emissaries and the messengers of gods they're the means through which messages are communicated a lot more mm-hmm. than they are than they are the gods themselves like the, the idea that the planets are the gods themselves is very Hellenistic like it's all Roman and Greek for the most part the Babylonians they saw the planets more as like messengers that communicated the will of the gods through things you know it's, 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 it's a different kind of keeping tight categorization system but it's different yeah things like the thing about um that happens i think with as we we i guess go from like a i guess a prehistoric period into the modern is that there, there's there's this gradual process of homogenization that happens mm. and um and we don't always know, we don't always know where all the parts come from that that's the thing so i mean like Astrology is, I, I, as we know it, is a is a combination of a whole bunch of practices. I think, yeah. Um, I've, I've like what got me in that train of thinking. Um, there's two thoughts to that. One was I remember my mom. Uh, I I was born very late, so my parents mm. were Depression era people, mm. and my mom always told the story about her relatives were from Tennessee, mm. and um the accent was so strong that she couldn't understand them. And she always said that she believed that it was because of TV and radio have <laughs> it made the accents more similar, but we still yeah. have accents, but, but they're easier to understand. Mm. And um, um, so instead of like being incomprehensible, it's like a little Southern twang. Yeah. And I, I've also noticed this when I was, and I, I started thinking about this with um, Santeria because I know some very old elders and uh, who are from um, more rural parts of Cuba. Mm. And um, they, they know practices that you just don't really hear about. Yeah. Quite so much. And, um, and I, and I've had the experience of them doing things during ceremonies with a bunch of young people and the young people complaining that they didn't know what they were doing mm. because it was so different. And, 
Um, and it kind of it got me realizing it's like, okay, well, I think you know, Santeria was really uh there were there was a greater degree of of you know kind of um um I wouldn't say not regional, but um congregation traditions, like 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 smaller, smaller congregations doing things their own way and things mm-hmm. sort of develop. And then and then as we get closer to the modern era uh, age where we have recordings and videos and books and things like that, things start to become homogenized into one practice that's considered to be orthodox. Yeah. And that happens, but I think that happens with all esoteric knowledge. So we have this, that's why I don't like arguing about when people identify them, themselves as being part of like a, a particular astrological um, grouping yeah. um, because it, 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 it sort of lends this like false orthodoxy to it. And if you yeah. start going outside it, like, you know, if, let's just say, you identify yourself as a strict Renaissance uh, astrologer and you only do Lily and Gadbury and people like that. And then all of a sudden you start doing Hellenistic lots. You have some people like, Oh, that's Hellenistic though. Mm. And people complain about that. I've seen that kind of complaint. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's not Renaissance. I'm like, what, you know, these, these aren't religions, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, so now we have this sort of like luxury of having a lot of ancient Hellenistic, Hellenistic material mm. and Arabic material and medieval material and Renaissance material. And I can guarantee you that if Lily had access to the books that we have today, then he probably would be doing things differently. Oh yeah, definitely. Like I've, I've often heard this, like this is the same thing about like, like people have the same argument with like hermetic texts and like, because like, like, Ficino translated the, the first 14 books of the like, Corpus Medicum and stuff. It's like, it, it always kind of makes me laugh. Like, especially like when people, again, I, I'm not disparaging the like ancient occult figures or anything like that, but it's like people have this tendency to like really put on pedestals, like the, the Renaissance magicians and the philosophers or that kind of thing. Where it's like, if you look at it logically, we have better access and probably better knowledge of the texts and like like a mm-hmm. larger tradition than most of they them did back in the day. You know, like oh, absolutely people like they, yeah. they glorify like John D or, or Facino or, or anything like that. You know, and they were you know huge titans. They were incredible. But it's like we have better access to texts and probably more historical knowledge and context of that whole thing than they did. You know, and yet they are kind oh, of put on the pedestal. You know, a lot more. The copy of Hermetica we have today is is far superior to what Ficino had. Yeah. Yeah. And I've his heard... translation is, is also not as good. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard this. It's like, it's not necessarily like his, like I've heard like mixed things about his Latin, but like, I don't know if it's just his Latin or if it's like, cause he's well, cause like the, the main issue with the Hermetica is it's all, it's all filled with Christian lenses, you know? So like, like we don't is... know how much of it is, is actually like authentic Hermetica mm. and how much is like re- re-edited through Christian lenses, you know, he's, he's starting from zero. Right. And we have we have to put that in perspective, and it, and it's not it, that's not a criticism. I mean, yeah. uh, c- I mean, could you imagine someone giving you this text in a foreign language that you have absolutely zero knowledge about? Yeah, and translating translating it for the first time is probably not going to be the best translation. Yeah, yeah. So okay. I, I don't hate on Ficino for that. No, 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 no. no. Doesn't mean I'm going to hang on the words either. But, no, uh, so you you kind of want to look like I think there is um like especially from Arabic like especially from Arabic because a lot of the technical hermetica and stuff like and, and like the astrological knowledge and stuff is also in Arabic. So I'm like I'm I'm because like I'm mainly hermeticist for the most part. It's like I, like a lot of my stuff is in hermetic uh, f- uh, philosophy, but I'm I'm really curious f- to like define. Like what? What? Like e- even if we can define it, like almost like a subgroup, in, even though we're not supposed to, yeah. You know, um, like finding like a like an actual fully fledged hermetic style of astrology, like we have Hellenistic, and that's the same thing. But like, if there is a subset of distinctly hermetic astrological practices, because we have like the hermetic lots and stuff like that, or like the Arabic the Arabic parts, uh, which are sometimes called hermetic lots. But I do wonder if there's like if, if there is a way that we can reconstruct like a, 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 a even if, if even if it's just like an interpretation system of like distinctly hermetic philosophy as like a subset of the Hellenistic, but I don't know if, I don't know if that would be an actual thing or not. So yeah, I'm, it's, I'm it's hard because about. the Corpus Hermeticum is pretty late and right. I know that it has tendrils that go much further back. Yeah. It goes back into the dynastic Egyptian in, in some capacity, but it's debatable. In some, yeah. but we don't know. Yeah. It's debatable. And I, so when you talk about Hellenistic, I'm sorry, hermetic astrology, um, astrology is inherently hermetic. Mm. 
Um, well, it's, it's one of the three hermetic arts, isn't it? Astrology, alchemy, right. and magic. Yeah. And I always, I often say that astrology is sort of like the physics uh, part of uh, the hermetic arts um, because it, it's sort of the commonality of all of it. Yeah. Um, but um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if there was ever a distinctly hermetic astrology as opposed mm-hmm. to a non-hermetic astrology, at least yeah. in the Hellenistic period. Yeah. Um, I'm not a hundred percent sure even about the label of hermetic lots mm. because I'm not sure. I, I don't know, actually, I don't know one way or the other, but I'm not sure if that was actually a term mm. that was ancient. Yeah, I, I've heard it on like some like more like traditional, like more like modern traditional astrology websites. No, people like, call people, it that. Yeah. And I don't think it's bad. I'm just like, but as, if you're talking about like as an ancient term, I'm not sure. Like, yeah. So like, diaper releasing is not an ancient it. term, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And like sect, like for, you know, day planets in a day chart, night planets in a night chart. Uh, we call that sect today. Mm. Uh, that's not an ancient term either. Um, yeah. so I'm not sure if hermetic, I mean, maybe it is, I'm just not sure if hermetic lots is an ancient term. And if so, if that points to a specifically hermetic practice, but to me, astrology is hermetic inherently. Yeah. That's sort of like, I don't know, saying like medical pharmaceutical arts. Yeah, so it's like an overwatch because like because like the other because like, I guess because the other name is like the Arabic parts, isn't it? Which is kind of like, like it's it's equally as vague almost. Well, that, and that was a la- that was a later that that's what the medieval Renaissance people called it because they thought it yeah. was an Arabic invention, hmm. uh, and that and that was like and that's a feature of, of especially Renaissance writing is they they were trying to get back to the to the Greeks. Right. It's, like, it's, and, like, it's, it's, it's that like classic perennialism of like going back to the sources, right? It's like the yeah. yeah. And getting rid of, the, of those, those terrible like corruptions that those evil Arabs did. Um, and in, and in doing so, we're actually getting rid of Greek material. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah cause, like, like, I, I can't remember, I, I can't remember this, um, where it was, but there's a theory that like, even when the, the Neoplatonic Academy, like eventually collapsed in, in Athens, that like some of like the final students of the Neoplatonists, like went across to what is eventually going to be Baghdad and then eventually went on to found the house of wisdom. You know, it's like there's like a, a Neoplatonic current through Arabic, but you know, it's, it's oh, there a, absolutely it's, is. Yeah. yeah, I don't know if it's that literal, but there is definitely a yeah, current. <laughs> but like, there's definitely there's definitely like a, a Platonic <laughs> theory or like, like the theory of that uh, is definitely running through Arabic stuff. Is, absolutely. Isn't there a gap between the fall of the academy and the founding of Baghdad? Isn't there like a yeah, yeah, yeah. So like two hundred year gap. There's, or there's stuff missing, but like, like it, it, it's a, a theory that's out there. I think that like like some. Like dis like but like in other words, like, like the lineal descendants of the Neoplatonic school eventually. Oh, I don't know, maybe. Another. I mean, because yeah. it was we know that Mashallah was involved in the election. Yeah, and we know that that was I think part of the was the Brethren or Purity available yet, or were they around yet? The I can't remember if they pre exist yeah. Baghdad. Yeah, no, because like. I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. No, they're like, in Baghdad, the, but... the, Well, because the letters of the Brethren were a huge influence on Picatrix. I, Picatrix even uses the same definition of magic as the letters do, actually. Yeah, there is definitely a link. No, they're absolutely, they, they, they absolutely use that as a, as a source. Yeah. I wish I was translated. <laughs> mm, yeah. Well, uh, well so I, I know because like all of all the very least, like the it's like the last one is like, it's like 50, like 52 letters or something like that. Like, it's like the last one is on. Is on magic, you know. Well, actually, this, like this was uh, actually this, this could be a good point to conclude, actually, because I know I've, I've kept you for like two and a half hours. <laughs> um, I have new gray right. hair now. I know. Uh, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna start going. My <laughs> my solar my solar main is gonna go to Saturnian. There you go. Um, <laughs> but no, so this is yeah, this was something I wanted to ask you actually. Um, because like uh, the way Agrippa kind of sets out the three books, it, they are they are kind of like a linear progression. Like you know, you start with with book one for nature, and then you work up mm-hmm. through the worlds, and you kind of work back that ascension. And he's like he's very clear even in the first book. He's like, yeah, you know, before you learn magic, you need to learn like the three branches of philosophy. You know, whether it's natural philosophy, mathematical philosophy, and then mm-hmm. theology. Like he the way he kind of implies it is that there's like a curriculum to magic you know like you do you don't just go straight into magic like there's a curriculum right. of learning that culminates with magic and this idea of like a like a, a curriculum that culminates in magic is very typical of islamic thought and it's, it's the same thing that's found in 
the letters of the brotherhood of or the brethren of purity right like those those letters they are inherently designed to be a curriculum where you learn things successively and then in the end it culminates with magic you know we, we have mm-hmm. the same thing with um oh what's his name on talismans um they imagine he was uh ibn kaba uh, uh ibn kaba. kura yeah like he has the same thing i think i think when he's translating or like when someone in i can't remember who it was like when he writes i can't remember if it's in the latin prologue of um they imagine was like but he talks about like how he goes to like well, like he studied all this stuff and then eventually he goes to like this muslim sage or whoever it was and then like after convincing or being convinced that it's licit in terms of islam he then learns magic as like the culmination of mm-hmm. his education and everything else and like and it got me wondering if the letters and that idea of the curriculum like as in like a curriculum of education that culminates in magic if that then influences the picatrix and the picatrix influences a gripper to a certain extent is there some kind of link between that kind of islamic curriculum of magic and the way a gripper explains like the progression of philosophy through his books and like culminating I don't know if it's, it's i think it's probably indirect yeah um, the, the part of what you're talking about in Picatrix is only in the Arabic version, mm. uh, not the Latin one. Yeah. Um, cause there's a short passage, which is, is written in a very confusing way. Mm. Um, but it says that magic is a syllogism mm. and that I'm butchering this quite a good, quite a bit because it's, it's written in a really weird way. Um, I'm dying for the new translation to come out of Picatrix. Oh yeah, I want to, I want to see how she does this. But Who, who's it? Basic... Is, it, is it Lina? Is it Lina Asavif? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, she was due like two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> where is it? <laughs> she's doing a lot of stuff. I think actually, she I'm is. Like, I know. I'm not, I'm I know really... she's also doing like Arabic Hamadika and stuff as well. Yeah, I know. But I, I'm just, I just want to, I want the book yeah. anyway. <laughs> um, that's all I'm saying. I'm being selfish. Um, but anyway, but it says that magic is a syllogism mm. and, um, and that, in or, you know, it's kind of what you were saying is that in order to learn magic, you have to embark on, uh, you know, a, a course of learning. Yeah. And then at the, when you've completed this course of learning, uh, you realize that magic was actually at the source. Mm. Uh, the magic is the friends that we met along the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, no, I, but I think about that a lot, and I think, uh, and, and, and Picatrix also explicitly in both the Latin and the Arabic, they they do tell you the things you have to learn. Yeah, and I think it might be what you're referring to. Mm. Um, and Agrippa implies that, but not as explicitly. And I don't, I don't know if he had, if he saw that even the, 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 the sections in the Latin version of Picatrix. I don't even know if he saw that. Yeah. Because uh, right. I don't have any evidence to see that he saw anything in there. The... I don't know why, because it's like I feel like if he had the book, he would have had more material. Yeah, to me, that's that's my yeah, because like, he could just like translate it over the incenses and the talisman and the ritual things. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, he would have put something like that. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, but it is implied that that was a very Renaissance thing, though. Mm. Um, that. The magician was like it was a culmination, uh, like a, a, someone who had like a a, a a a cumulative level of learning that other people just didn't have. And I I I've thought about that a lot from the, from a modern standpoint because I I think that you know um, ma- people who do ma- magical practitioners today, um, well not today ever <laughs> in history, um, transcend a lot of cultures. Yeah. Um, and to me, it's like the takeaway is that if you to be proficient in magic, you have to be well versed in the knowledge of your culture, I think, mm-hmm. is the takeaway, uh, because I don't think I need to tell um, someone in, in like Nigeria <laughs> that they, they need to learn, you know, rhetoric and mathematics right. i mean and there are plenty who do but i mean i but in order to do magic it's it's like it's it's ridiculous uh mm-hmm. to tell people from all these in all these different cultures and all these different parts of the world that they need they need to learn these like hermetic arts in order to know magic um i don't believe that but i but i have known um like in the santeria world i've known people who are highly proficient in magic 
mm-hmm. um, who don't know those things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's, it's, it's um, like intuitive photo. Yeah, yeah, um, but they're incredibly intelligent and know how to sort of they they understand uh, the parts of the world they need to know. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, th- I think it's kind of the important thing is I I, I think that sitting to be part of that takeaway is like you don't necessarily learn magic by reading books on magic. Mm. Um, You you have to actually live out in the world yeah, and have relationships, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, I mean, that's, that's really what the, what, what, what that's all about. And, you know, it's, you don't like sitting in your basement. Um you know, reading Solomonic magic isn't necessarily going to make you a great magician. Yeah. Yeah. Actually doing it. <laughs> with the- if that, well, not, not even, even just, but even if you're just doing it. Yeah. Even, even if you're following everything to the letter in the book and you're doing so faithfully and consistently, that does not mean you're a great magician because it's like you're missing, you're missing this like real world component to it. Cause what difference does it make if you know how to conjure the spirit if 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 you're just if if your entire life is like sitting in a basement right yeah <laughs> it's like yeah because it, it's also kind of weird it's like some people who like on a it, it's a way to kind of like i, I don't want to say like rat out the frauds but like one of the things like people who i've seen in like some major occult groups on like facebook or whatever like that it's, it's, and it's, it's always happened it always seems to be facebook for this kind of thing as well it's really weird um but like they'll be trying they'll be like giving advice on like traditional occultism or traditional solomonic magic and then you like you see like their entire profile like you see their house or whatever and it's like it's it's like a dump <laughs> you know? right it's like it's, it's, it's like right. it just doesn't work it's like okay well like something doesn't add up there like you're claiming to be able to summon these amazing like incredible spirits and yet you're living in like a shack like in your mom's basement yeah, and, like and i'm not i'm not gonna like housekeep shame anybody because no no no, 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 no i mean there, there's a lot of uh because i mean the history of magic uh also includes people who live in uh very uh austere conditions <laughs> right or like that like, uh, like even, I, even like d and kelly like they, they ended up being nomad like nomadic throughout europe and like, they didn't have well, i'm talking about the people you haven't heard of oh yeah well yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah or you and i you and i both not you personally hmm. um because i mean it's like uh I, I mean god if you read like these old inter- interviews in the 19 1930s on hoodoo hmm. um you know, the African-American folk magic, um, mostly in the South. And yet people who are very poor. Yeah. Um, living in, you know, in very poor conditions and doing magic. Hmm. And it, it isn't necessarily that they're, they're going to be like, they're going to be living in these, in these like great mansions and they're rich. Um, no, they were, they were doing things to protect themselves. They were doing medicine, uh, you know, things of that nature. Um, and they were, and they were highly intelligent. Too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like it, it, it's 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 not that like I don't know. Um, you have to be opulent, or even living in this like you know proverbial wizard tower with these like name you know uh, mysterious nameless bottles of whatever. Yeah, behind the, the, you, the, the necromancer's cave. Yeah, right. Yeah, it, it, you know, none of that is necessary. I mean, we're we're, we're talking about regular people yeah. who live you know in all all walks of life, and. Um, so I don't I don't really care about that, but it's just like I feel like that if you're like using hoodoo as an example, they, they weren't sitting there buying hoodoo books, right? Because it, you know they were they were like they were they were um, you know being informed by their by their by spirits and by their ancestors on mm-hmm. things to do to help to help themselves, yeah, using things that they had access to. That yeah. that's 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 real magic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know it, it makes you know? it makes me wonder a lot about like and i'm I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna piss off a lot of traditionalists by saying this, especially the solomonic tradition uh, or solomonic people it makes me wonder how much of like the the grimoire solomonic stuff was actually done in person and how much of it is like representative of the idealized form of magic you know i've asked myself like, the same question <laughs> yeah you know it's like you look at it and it's like I don't know, especially when you consider like how, like, yes, today getting a hold of materials is is a challenge, right? But like even back in the day, you know, when they were writing stuff, like getting a hold of, of certain materials would have been ridiculously expensive or very, very hard right. to do, right? So I'm like, 
it does make me wonder when you look at things like the, like the Metatron or, or any of the Kia Solomon traditions, right? Or any, any of the Grimoires, where like they're talking about all of these in, like huge amounts of tools and these things that you need to do. It's like, it makes me wonder how much of that is like the ideal ritual archetype of like, here's the best case scenario versus like how much it was actually done and like how much, and, like what substitu- right. like substitutions and things would have been made, you know? Well, and by, by extension, to what degree this was even normalized practice. Right. And it's like, is this part of a wider tradition and things like right. that? And it's like, is I'm like, to be honest, this is where I, I disagree with some of like the bigger names in occultism, like Summer Magic, where like, I don't necessarily know if there is like a, I, I, I have objections every now and again to this idea of saying there is a Solomonic tradition as a whole. Like, I don't, I don't necessarily well, it's, agree that it's a whole. It, it, people, like, a they're, they're trying to, some people want to legitimize what they're doing right. by giving it a, Making like a, a fancy, of a tra- of a fancy fling chain. to it, yeah. Um, but th- I, so the thing is, is that you know, can you know, does Solomonic magic work? Probably, yeah. You know, um, I mean, ma- all magic works and does not work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depending right. on who you are. But, um, and and should people experiment and try and try to do things as much as they can by the book? Absolutely. Why not? You know, we have we have this material. They should absolutely try to do it, um, and I don't I don't disparage anyone trying to do that. Mm. Um, but you know, do do we? You know, d- does that mean that's what what medieval magic was? Mm. We can't say that. No, it, it, it's what medieval magic was among some people. Yeah, um, was Joe Blow in rural France doing this magic? Probably not. Yeah. Um, that's what I'm saying about like this this homogenization that happens. I mean, and also like we, you know we've had this theme that we've talked about with the accidents of history. Um, a lot of things weren't written down. Yeah, and we have certain books that were written down, and we probably lost more than that. Yeah. And what what is what is the number I've heard that in we have something like ten percent of ancient books. Yeah, of, it's uh, something like that. Books. Like even even in like the was it even even in hermetic stuff it, it, it's, it's like one of those things where it's like you look back at it and it's really sad and also like they're, like the ancient authors are kind of trolling us at times like like, like you see this like the nakamari so like the gnostic stuff sometimes like there's in I, I think i can't remember if it's like the air the discourse of the eighth and ninth or the prayer of thanksgiving or something like it, it's one of like the hermetic thought ones in, in, in the nakamari library where like the scribe at the end he's like he like he he like adds like a little like citation for, like to the end of the whole thing. He's like, oh yeah, I was gonna send you like the the fifty other hermetic books, but I know you already have them, so I'm just not gonna bother including like, them. Damn. But it's like, <laughs> no. we we don't even have the entire like, um, Homeric cycle. Yeah, yeah. You know? But no, but I was saying, yeah. I mean, I'm not trying to like make people doing Solom- Solomonic magic feel bad, but no, I, I but I feel like that. And also, I'm not saying that it doesn't work. I mean, it's it's just yeah. that I feel like that. Um, I I I am a hundred percent in favor of people fucking around and finding out. Yeah, it's like the, they should the definitely core of experiment. Magic. Yeah, fuck around and find out. It's the core of, of all magic. Yeah, we we have these books. We might as well use them. And I and I encourage people to experiment with them. Mm. Um, but what I what I do criticize is this notion that that was what magic was. Yeah, because we don't we can't know that. Yeah, and we don't know to what extent that was a tradition. Like as you were saying, mm-hmm. um, I mean, I, I, I've and this is gonna piss off a few people too. But I mean, there's all these these like, um, uh, comparisons being made with like, um, African diasporic traditions mm-hmm. and or religions and 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 and, and, and comparisons made. And some of these comparisons are not even correct yeah um I've, I've seen some weird things being said about things that i do which weren't aren't done <laughs> um and, and and again it's just it's a way to kind of legitimize a body of knowledge that is poorly documented yeah you know um but the bottom line is we have these books and my, i mean I, I have friends who have been working with some of these grimoires for you know couple of decades and you know they're highly proficient in what they're doing i mean Mm. yes i mean i'm not i I do think it works but 
you really have to put all this stuff in perspective is there's so much that we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we'll probably, well, we'll never know. Yeah. And it's like, it like, it kind of makes me laugh sometimes when people like, I, I understand the need for people like wanting to legitimize their own practice and legitimize what, whatever they're doing. Like, I, sure. I understand it completely. It's like, it does kind of make me laugh when people have like the slight twinge of arrogance with it. Or they're like, Oh, well, I'm doing Solomonic. I know what Solomonic is. Or like, um, with it goetia is like the you know people think like goetia is like all of western magic you know like the entire history of western magic i'm like no mm, no not yeah. really <laughs> that's, demon- that's demonstrably not true yeah and um i it's like what what was it um like like i've 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 seen people argue that they're doing like picatrix magic by the book and i'm like yeah. no you are not yeah you're absolutely not doing it by the book yeah I don't, I've never met anybody who does it by the book. And I don't think anybody in the United States is doing it by the book. I'm sorry. Yeah. Unless they're like <laughs> fully like full on just like sacrificing the animals and bloodletting and doing all the other stuff. I'm like, nah. I mean, I've actually thought about it. Mm. Um, and I mean, because I'm, I'm trained in that. Right. Um, but I haven't done it quite yet. Uh, but, um, but I'm not, I don't encourage people to do it either. I mean, yeah. I, I, I because I don't want any any animals getting tortured. Yeah, of course. <laughs> they yeah. shouldn't be tortured, but um but that I just that's part of my practice. I do know how to, I know I know how to kill a rooster. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 it's no, you know, like I, I know we have like all the ethical qualms about it in, in, in you know modern society right now, but like it's it's really no different from killing animals for food, ultimately. It yeah. shouldn't be any different. I don't like doing it. Yeah. And, of course. Um that's 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 one of the things always, I've always been hasten to add it's like if if it was something that the Arisha said stop doing it i'd be fine with yeah um but it's food yeah so i'm like i'm, we, we do, I'm, we I'm the same it, i'm like i'm always if i can find the substitutions i will you know i'll, I'll, I'll go to, i'll go to like good lengths to find the substitutions you know like i've never done it so i wouldn't you know i wouldn't encourage yeah. people to do it so but but i have thought about the other picket tricks because i do wonder, it is quite specific yeah yeah i wonder how different that's going to make things but yeah i wonder if there is like as like as much as i don't like psychologizing magic or i do wonder if there is a psychological component to it as well or like if you're well, there's always a psychological like component yeah um it's, like it's not, it's not it like whether that actually like influences the outcome of the ritual the efficacy of the ritual i don't know but um i think i think to some extent i mean picatrix talks about that i mean they say it in the terms of belief yeah I, it, it, it's in like yeah. the it's in it's near the beginning isn't it in like book one or whatever it's like yeah like the operator I, I think even i think even agrippa talks about this actually like, like i think agrippa on. does too yeah where he's like you have to like I, I like it's kind of funny like well like because like, i know sometimes people in the cult community they're like oh i don't like the whole well like they, they like re- like they reject the whole like new age practice of like belief manifestation whatever it's like it's it's fairly accurate in, in traditional sources too and it's like agrippa and Pickett, they both say like the operator has to believe in the efficacy of what they're doing you know that you, you have to but you also have to do it doing it's gonna work <laughs> yeah <laughs> but who was that i mean i think chris warnock made the the analogy that you know, it's like you could be, you know, if you're playing basketball, you still have to believe yeah. that, you know, that you could play the game yeah. in order to play it. I mean, you can't just like go into a basketball game as a player and be like, I think a basketball's stupid and I want no part in it whatsoever. You're probably not going to play well. Yeah. You know, um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not it's not as popular to talk about, but um, it, it, it's the thing. It, it, it's never it's, I mean, it really is never all of one thing. Mm. or the other it's like it isn't all about belief and intention yeah uh, but you have to have you can't do anything without intention you can't yeah. get out of bed without intention um but intention alone doesn't really make the magic work work either but you also can't do magic in a half-hearted um cynical way and expect yeah. it to work either yeah yeah. yeah. So both it, both, both things have to be there. Yeah. 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 It's all contextual. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll, I mean, on, on that note, then let's, let's conclude with this. And so like out of everything you've experienced so far, what do you think, like what are some decent inroads to this for people who are listening, who are kind of brand new to this, who are in, maybe new to traditional astrology or, or astrological magic or anything like that? Or Picatrix, like I, w- I wouldn't necessarily say start with Picatrix. It's, it's not a beginner text at all. It's not easy um, to read. No, um, but in your experience, what are some like inroads people can make into into you know approaching these these sources or approaching these texts or anything like that? 
I, I think, well, in terms of astrology, it's easy if you have a teacher to get started. Um, yeah. Because I think just simply reading books, um, it's hard to put everything in perspective. Mm. Uh, I'm not saying you can't do it, and people do do it, but I think it's harder. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we mentioned Chris Warnock a few times. He's he's a good you know yeah. place to get started. Um, and he has he has courses on horary and natal and electional and magic and all these things. Um, but that being said, you're not going to be like, if you take his astrological magic class, it doesn't mean you're going to be this like amazing mage mm. just because you took the class. Yeah. Well, you, you need but to implement it. You need to do the work. Yeah. You have to do the work and you, you still have to like spend a lot of time understanding, mm. um, sources and practicing the actual magic and practicing the astrology and things like that. Mm. Um, so it's easier to get started with a teacher. Um, I, I do think, you know, not to toot my own horn, but I think that three books is also like a nice place because it's a good, start. It's a good entry point. Yeah, absolutely. It is because you're, there aren't, there aren't many books that summarize um, all of these different sources in one place and put them in and then, and then put them together in a coherent way, like Agrippa yeah. does. Um, and I think my version is the easiest to read. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, Pick a tricks. I do recommend, but it's not a beginner's book. Like you said, it's, yeah. it's smaller and it looks more approachable. And then you start reading it. It's it's not easy. Yeah. Um, there's a good book on astrology called "On the Heavenly Spheres." Hmm. Are you familiar with that one? I've I've heard of it. I I think I saw it on oh was it Anathema Press? I think. I think I think they're redistributing it. Something. Maybe I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's by Helena Avalar and Luis Ribeiro. Hmm. And um, it's it's very firmly uh, Renaissance astrology, mm. um, but it gets you through in modern layman's language, mm. basic concepts in astrology. It's a really good first book, I think. Um, if you want to get into Hellenistic material, I recommend both um, Chris Brennan's book on Hellenistic astrology, which I think is just called Hellenistic astrology. Mm. <laughs> and... Demetra George's two volume book on uh I think it's called Ancient Astrology, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I I, I saw it. I I I was I was I it's it's uh, I was just talking about this that uh, I was talking about it today actually this morning. Um somebody asked me on my Instagram page, like, what are some good sources of traditional astrology? And I said that one. So I, I haven't yeah. got it yet. I really I, I it looks really good. So I wanna like I They're both it. both Demetra and Chris's are good. I think I don't want to um pick one over the over the other to sure. be honest with you yeah, yeah um because they both of them have done a lot to uh teach people on the, this, this ancient astrology and uh but dimitri i mean even chris brennan who um wrote the first modern book on hellenistic astrology um you know even he puts dimitri up in a at a different level mm. <laughs> you know um they they, they 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 both done a lot of really good work so i recommend both of them yeah um yeah but yeah, and then, then you know, from there, you know, hopefully gives you know, gives people courage to sort of branch out, because you can't you can't start out with, I don't think you can easily start out with, um, Banati or, yeah, Abu Mashar and all these others. It's it's a little bit difficult to do that. I think you have to start on something that's kind of more modern and, yeah, more digestible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, but I mean, speaking of that, because like I like even your you with your edition of Agrippa, it's very digestible. Are you? What are you currently working on right now? Are you working on anything that you want to share? What's um, upcoming for you? I have a lot of half projects happening. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I, I had some postpartum depression after finishing Agrippa. Mm, I, um, I, I, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of my life. Um, I am sort of starting a translation on a. Uh, a late traditional book, um, astrological book, um, that's being, it's very difficult to do. So mm. I'm kind of working my way through there slowly, but in the meantime, um, I want to work on like a, more of a commentary on some traditional techniques mm. and, um, and I'm also contemplating a course on Agrippa. So yeah, it's going to be really good when that happens. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Well, keep me posted, and I will. Yes, I'll, I'll put it out you'll, on on the. You'll be on the, the second channel. to know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll put it out on the channel that everyone know. 
<laughs> oh, brilliant. All right. Well, Eric, thank you for coming on. We've, well, I've, I've kept you for like three hours. We've rambled, but there you go. Oh my gosh, it has been. Yeah. <laughs> it never feels like it on these things, but there you go. We've reached the other end of the tunnel. Yeah. We've come out the other end. We're all, hopefully everyone now knows about astrology and Agrippa way more. <laughs> We've now finished Eleusinian Elis- initiation. Yeah, we've we've, we've <laughs> found the greater mysteries. That's it. We've been revealed. <laughs>